Your Honor, this is a case of Remington Stone versus Marley Meiser and Acme Construction Company. All counsel and parties are present. Good morning, everyone may be seated. And let me begin by asking uh, counsel to state their appearances for the record. I'll start with the plaintiff. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Jacqueline Mendel, and my co-counsel is Kaylee Juliet. Good morning, Your Honor. And Yoho Zhang. Good morning, Your Honor. I also have a roster for the plaintiff, if you would like. That would be great. Thank you. You can hand that to Mr. Young. And I'm approaching the person counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Ms. Mandel. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Noah Glazer, and along with my co-counsel, Alana Farbiage, and Charlie Lubwall, we, we represent the defendant, Mr. Marley Miser. We also have a roster with counsel, witnesses, and pre-marked exhibits, if that's convenient for you. Thank you, Ms. Glazer. Let me ask if there are any uh, pretrial issues that we should take up before opening statements. Yes, Your Honor. First of all, with the with respect to these exhibits, I see opposing counsel has pre-marked them. In which case, I would request that ours are also pre-marked. Would you prefer that we bring the pre-marked to the bailiff already? That would be fine. You may bring them up to Mr. Young. I also have a list of the exhibits, if you would like. Thank you. Your Honor, I am pre-marking the affidavits. These are only being marked for notification purposes for use for cross. Your Honor, I would also request that all witnesses be constructively sequestered from the courtroom, except, of course, the parties to the case. Okay. Uh, is there any objection to that? Your Honor, we would just add that to have the two expert witnesses in this case also be constructively sequestered. I, I think that's fine. I think ever, all the witnesses other than the two parties will be constructively uh, sequestered for the proceeding. Obviously, they may remain in the courtroom, um, but uh, constructive sequestration will apply to them. Finally, Your Honor, would you prefer that we stay behind the podium or maybe step out from the podium? If the parties are, wish to move around the courtroom, you're welcome to do so. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further briefs on that. Great. Um, Bill, uh, Ludwell, or whoever, uh, anyone from the uh, uh, defendants, if there are any pretrial issues? The defense has uh, no pretrial matters to discuss. Great. Um, okay, and who will be opening for, um, uh, for the plaintiff? I will. Okay, and for the defendant? I will be, Your Honor. Hey. May I proceed with opening, Your Honor? You, uh, you may, Ms. Ms. Mando. Go ahead. May it please the court, counsel, Your Honor, Bennington Stowe suffered life-altering burns when she fell from a faulty ladder provided by Molly Miser onto a live 220 volt wire left on by Miser while doing work that Miser directed and controlled at his house. As Ben Franklin famously said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It could have been so easy for the defendant to provide reasonable and adequate protection to prevent this terrible accident, as is required by labor law section 200. He did not. And as a result, a pound of cure is needed here today. Your Honor, under Labor Law Section 200, homeowners have a non-delegable general obligation to provide reasonable and adequate protection to the health and safety of all invitees in their home. Here, the evidence will show that this accident happened firstly because Miser created and allowed dangerous working conditions to persist and failed to remedy those conditions in a timely manner. 
And secondly, because Miser directed and controlled Remington Stone's work. Either of these will be sufficient for a cover against the defendant. But here, both will be shown to be true by a preponderance of the evidence. Your Honor, you will hear from Remington herself about the homeowner, Marley Miser, who was on the job site more than the site supervisor, Reese Withers. Miser was always pressing the workers to get the job done on time. And you will hear he constantly supervised and instructed Remington on how to perform the work. Your Honor, the evidence will show that on the date of the accident, September 23, 2021, Remington used a ladder kept on the active job site by Miser, despite Miser knowing that it was defective and dangerous and missing the rubber feet that it should have had. The evidence will show that the floor of the job site was wet that morning, readily apparent to Mr. Miser, who lived in the other half of the house. And the evidence will show that Miser was aware of, but cannot even confirm that he ever turned the power off. And he never warned the workers about the live 220 volt wire hidden behind that wall. Voltage powerful enough to kill somebody. Your Honor, the evidence will show that Miser was so hell-bent on getting the job done on his terms that despite his own extensive industry knowledge as a building inspector, he allowed Remington to proceed with the work despite the hazards. Your Honor, you will also hear from Dakota Springs, the union steward who helped get Remington her job. She can tell you how she has known Remington for a long time. She can tell you about her safety practices, and good habits, and that she is a capable employee. Finally, you will hear from Dr. Alexis Anderson, a workplace safety expert. Dr. Anderson concluded after careful examination of the facts at hand and comprehensive interviews of the defendant, the plaintiff, and the union steward, that the accident was caused by unsafe working conditions created and allowed to persist by the homeowner, Molly Meiser. Your Honor, it is important to be clear that the relevant law here today is Nirvana's labor laws. This is not a negligence claim. We expect the defense to call several witnesses today who will try to shift the blame onto Remington Stone and argue about contributory negligence. But, Your Honor, Nirvana's labor laws are there to protect workers in precisely the type of scenario we have here today. And because this is a labor law claim, arguments about contributory negligence just do not apply. Your Honor, the evidence will show that Mr. Miser was controlling and omnipresent at the job site as a supervisor of the work. He created and allowed dangerous working conditions to persist. Miser could so easily have taken reasonable and adequate steps to protect Remington Stone. He did not provide that ounce of prevention. That was his obligation under the law. And at the close of this trial, we will be asking this court to find for the plaintiff. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Meadow. May I proceed, Your Honor? Uh, you may. Thank you, Ms. Meadow. Your Honor, this is a case about personal responsibility. It's a person's responsibility to look both ways before crossing the street. It's a person's responsibility to know if a pan is hot and not touch it. And it's a person's responsibility to check for wet floors and defective ladders before climbing on them. If you take a broken ladder and you put it on a wet floor, and on top of that, you use improper procedure when positioning it, Your Honor, you're going to get hurt. This is what happened to the plaintiff, Miss Remington Stone, on September 23rd of 2021. But this case really begins in the hours before the plaintiff's careless accident, most of which she spent glued to the side of a bar. Your Honor, the evidence will show that on the night of the 22nd, the plaintiff sat by the bar, throwing back drink after drink until she couldn't even stand on her own. And after staying out far later than most other workers, the plaintiff stumbled home past midnight. And when she arrived to the work site a mere seven hours later, she really wasn't in good shape. The evidence will show that on the 23rd, the plaintiff didn't wait for the ladder that her supervisor provided her with, 
rather took the clearly broken one stashed in the corner. The evidence will further show that even in her tired or hungover condition, the plaintiff was still able to identify the wet and slippery condition of the floor. Your Honor, we sympathize with the plaintiff's injuries, but that does nothing to change the fact that the plaintiff contributed to her own accident. And now, Your Honor, instead of taking that personal responsibility, the plaintiff is simply looking for someone to blame. To even have a chance at prevailing on her claim, the plaintiff must prove three elements. First, that my client, Mr. Marley Miser, was the owner of the property and had supervisory control of the work that produced her injuries. Second, that Mr. Miser failed to keep the premises and equipment thereon in conditions safe for working. And third, that that failure was the cause of the plaintiff's injuries. The plaintiff will be unable to prove any of these things, and even if she could, the evidence will still show that the plaintiff contributed to her own accident, thus defeating her claims. How will we prove this, Your Honor? First, we will prove the plaintiff's negligence through the cross-examination of the plaintiff's witnesses. You'll hear the plaintiff himself admit to staying out far too late the night before and in her condition the next morning, still being able to identify the wet and slippery floors. Then, Your Honor, you'll hear from the plaintiff's close family friend, Ms. Dakota Springs. Ms. Springs will attest to the plaintiff's long-standing history of alcoholism, as well as tell you she wasn't there on the day of the accident. Then, Your Honor, you'll hear from the defense's witnesses. You'll hear from my client, Mr. Marley Miser, a 78-year-old retiree with 50 years of experience in the construction industry. Mr. Miser will tell you that while he was often present on site, his home, and gave helpful tips and advice to workers, he was absolutely not the supervisor of this project. He will further tell you that the conditions of the ladder and the floor were open and obvious. Then, Your Honor, we'll hear from AFSCME hired supervisor, Ms. Withers. Ms. Withers will corroborate Mr. Miser's testimony that he was not the supervisor of the project, as well as relate the plaintiff's working habits of showing up to the work site tired, irritable, and unbalanced. And finally, Your Honor, we'll hear from Dr. Skyler Harris. Dr. Harris is an expert in accident reconstruction, and in fact, the only expert here today to have completed an accident reconstruction. And from that, he came to the conclusion that had the plaintiff simply used proper procedure when positioning her ladder, she would not have fallen. Your Honor, the moment the plaintiff in her tired, hungover, or even careless state stepped onto that ladder, she became contributorily negligent in her own accident. Your Honor, at the end of this case, it would have been clear that the plaintiff failed to meet her burden in proving that Mr. Miser had supervisory control of the work that produced her injuries, that Mr. Miser failed to keep the premises and equipment thereon in a condition safe for working, and that that failure caused the plaintiff's injuries. Moreover, the defense would clearly prove that if not in whole, then certainly in part, the plaintiff was responsible for her own actions. And Your Honor, Nirvana law is crystal clear. If you find the plaintiff even 1% negligent, you must rule in favor of the defense. Your Honor, at the end of this case, after a careful examination of the fact and a simple application of the law, we will ask that you return the only verdict consistent with the evidence, a verdict in favor of the defense. Thank you. Thank you. Plaintiff, please call their first witness. Yes, Your Honor, the plaintiff calls Remington Stone to the stand. Step into the box and raise, raise, remain standing and raise your right hand. And do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. You may have a seat. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourself to the court? Yes, my name is Remington Stone, and I'm 28 years old. Where do you reside? At 534 South Percy Street in Gotham, Nirvana. And what is your educational background? I earned my high school diploma a few years back. Following high school, what did you do next? I really wanted to get into the electrical field as much as possible, so I tried to pursue that uh, after graduating. 
What of any steps did you take in pursuing your dreams? I made a big move to a new city, the city of Gotham. I started my apprenticeship and I tried to get my journeyman's license. Did you ever achieve your journeyman's license? No, unfortunately I didn't. I couldn't complete it. So what did you do following that? Well, by this point, I was living by myself. I had to sustain myself and I started looking for employment in August of 2021. During that year, what of any employment did you find? I was hired by a union by the name of Home Renovators, and they worked closely with Acme Construction, a construction company. Where did you work with Home Renovators? I was assigned to one of Acme's sites, which was renovating Marley Miser's old Victorian house. On that job site, what was your role? I was new. I mean, I had more manual jobs, such as, you know, hauling stuff around, but my most important task was to take down drywall, put new drywall up. On a daily basis, who, if anyone, did you receive instructions from on that job site? Well, mostly from Marley Miser. I mean, Reese Withers was supposed to be in charge, but he was never around. You mentioned Marley Miser. What did you know about him at the time? Not much. I mean, I knew he was the owner of the house. I knew he knew quite a bit about construction, and he had experience, a lot of experience, construction, but that was about it. From your observations on that job site, when was he around? All the time. I mean, no matter when I was on the work site, Marley Miser was there, and he was always giving me instruction, telling me what to do and how to do it. Now, let's fast forward to the day of your accident. <clears throat> What do you remember from when you first arrived on the job site that day? I arrived normal time, 7.30 in the morning, and I remember meeting Marley, how I did every single morning. What did you do next? I had a job to get done that day. I started looking for my tools and uh, the ladder, which I needed to use. And did you ever find these tools that you were looking for? I found my tool belt. Um, I just didn't find the ladder that I needed. Did you find any other ladders on the job site? I did. I eventually found one, and I asked for permission before using it. And what was Miser's response? Well, I asked Mr. Miser for uh, permission. He indicated it was fine to use, which is why I went ahead and used it. Why did you ask Miser's permission to use the ladder? It was my understanding that when Reese Withers wasn't around, Molly Miser was our supervisor, and Reese was never around. Objection. Move to strike the witness's testimony about Marley meeting her supervisor as giving a legal conclusion. Your Honor, from this witness's understanding, Miser was their supervisor on days when Reese Withers was away. Um, I will uh, strike the statement that uh, Marley Miser was the witness's supervisor, but you may uh, elicit questions that support that conclusion. Yes, Your Honor. So the objection is sustained. Prior to your accident, what, if any, directions were you given about pitching your ladder? I was aware of the 4 to 1 rule, which just talks about ladder placement. And after pitching your ladder that day, what happened? Well, that was when um, the ladder that I was using slipped, and I fell onto a live wire, which I had no idea was even there, and I was severely hurt. What, if anything, do you remember from the site of your accident? Well, it's all a big blur. It's, it's been a couple years now. Um, I remember the floor being a little wet. I knew the windows had been taken out for another project. You mentioned the floor was wet. From your observations, who, if anyone else, was on the job site that day when the floor was in that condition? Marley Miner, just how he was every single day. Prior to your accident, when, if at all, were you given warnings about this live 220 volt wire that you talked about? I never was. Nobody ever told me about any type of wiring. On that day, what, if any, interactions did you have with Miser? I first met him when I arrived on the work site. I asked him about the ladder, talked with him a number of times. And during those interactions, when, if at all, did he warn you about this live wire? Never, never. He never told me anything, and he knew where I was working. He never said a word. 
about any type of live wire. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross examination. permission to use the ladder, yeah. So Marley said whatever? Yeah, and to me that was his permission. To but use he didn't ladder. say yes, Ms. Stone, did he? He didn't say no. Ms. Stone, I want to be clear. The only word that was said was whatever, was it not? Yes, that's correct. Now, you testified that you didn't know that much about Marley, but you didn't like listening to him, did you? Well, it was constant. His instructions and directions were constant was all the time. So that's all the goodness stone, but to be clear, you didn't like listening to Marla, did you? I mean, it was just, it was bothersome to a point, you know? I couldn't really get my work done, just because I always had him in my ear. So I want to get a straight answer from you. You didn't like listening to Marla, correct? Objection, Your Honor, ask an answer. Uh, overall, you may ask. Should I make a question? Yes, please. You didn't like listening to Marla, did you? I didn't like to, but I had to. Well, you say that you had to, but to be clear, no one had ever told you that Marley was your supervisor, correct? No, but I recall Reese telling me that I should listen to Miser. Objection. Move to strike the witness's testimony as hearsay. Your Honor, she was merely clarifying her response to the question. Um, I think the answer was responsible. Uh, why should be allowed as hearsay? Your Honor, this was not hearsay. It goes to effect on the listener as she then understood that Marley Miser was her supervisor on the job. May I respond, John? You may. Um, the statement is being offered for its truth, for apparent truth, which is that Marley Miser was someone worth listening to and had experience. I was, um, I'll strike any statement that Mr. Miser had experienced. I will allow uh, the statement that she should be uh, uh, that he should she should be listening to. Him. You once told Marley Miser and Stone to just let you do your job, right? Yes, that's correct. I knew I could do it. In fact, Ms. Stone, the language you used was "get lost, you old idiot." Was it not? No, I don't recall. I simply said, "Let me do my job." It's all going to be okay. Let's go back a bit, Ms. Stone. You went to a party before your accident, did you not? A union retirement party, that's correct. And you chose to sit at the bar, correct? It was very crowded. I was talking with a lot of my colleagues at the bar. Despite, Ms. Stone, your history of alcoholism? Objection, Your Honor. More prejudicial than probative, as well as beyond the scope of direct examination. Um. Um, Your Honor, this goes to the part of the case uh, proving Ms. Stone's contributory negligence. Your Honor! Sorry, Sorry. The, 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 through her irresponsible behavior the night before and the day of her accident. What, but the history of alcoholism seems different than what, if anything, she was doing the night before. Why should um, the question about history of alcoholism be allowed? Uh, because in light of her history, um, decisions that for a normal person may be perfectly appropriate for her, they're irresponsible. Your Honor, at this point, this is being offered as a propensity argument and is speculative that she was consuming alcohol that night. Why isn't this being offered for propensity, showing bad acts that occurred in the past that reflect how she occurred the day at issue and therefore wouldn't be allowed under Rule 203? I'm happy to move on, Your Honor. Okay. I'll, I'll sustain the objection. May. The final call for drinks was past midnight, correct? If I recall correctly, yes. And when you heard that final call for drinks, you chose to have one more, correct? Another Diet Cola. The party went on for quite a while. Ms. Stone, you chose to leave the party at 12.30, correct? As I said, the party went on for quite a long time. I was, I was happy to finally talk to my coworkers outside work. Ms. Stone, you only got up from the bar once during this party. Isn't that true? A couple of times, but you did get up. And the one time, sorry, Ms. Stone, is it your testimony that you got up from the bar multiple times during the night? Well, I had to use the bathroom. I was there at a party. I was talking to my colleagues. 
Okay, Ms. Stone, to prepare for this case, you submitted an affidavit, correct? Yes, I did. Permission to approach the witness, Your Honor? I do not. Can you get a copy for the person counsel if you'd like to? Thank you. So in this affidavit, you swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, correct? Yes, I did. Can you flip to the back, please? Sure. Or last page, is that your signature there? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Ms. Stone, yes. directing to your attention to paragraph 18. Okay. You state that you only stood up once to go to the restroom. Isn't that true? Objection, Your Honor. Reading from a document is not evidence. I would not mind if you would like to refresh the witness's recollection, but reading from the document is improper. I'll sustain as to, to form. Um, so uh, you may ask if this re refreshes for like, recollection. Uh, sorry, Your Honor, um, yeah. you'd like me to use this affidavit to refresh your recollection? Um, you may ask her uh, to reread that portion and, see, see, and ask her if that refreshes her recollection. Could you please read paragraph 18 to yourself, please? Sure. And when you're ready, you're ask the question again. Yep. You only got up from the bar once during the party, correct? Well, as I stated, I got up once to go to the bathroom, but as I said, I stood up a number of times to talk to my colleagues, and then there was a party. Okay, Ms. Stone, when you got up to go to the bathroom, you stumbled, did you not? I tripped on the stool, yes. You testified earlier, Ms. Stone, that you were drinking Diet Cola all night, but you asked the bartender for the usual, did you not? Yes, because, as I said, I had more than one Diet Cola. But Ms. Stone, you didn't use the word Diet Cola when you ordered a drink, correct? No, because it wasn't the first one. You went to work the next morning, Ms. Stone, right? Yes, I did. You were walking very slowly that morning, weren't you? I was, yes, a bit slow. You have bloodshot eyes too, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what you told me. You were tired, Ms. Stone, correct? A little tired. In fact, Ms. Stone, you said that you were about as good as you were going to get that day, didn't you? Yes. You came to work at 7.30, right? Yes, my usual start time. Seven hours after you left the party, though, right? Um, yes. Ms. Stone, you had to get yourself home from the party, right? Uh, yeah. And then you had to get ready for bed, right? That's correct. And the following morning, you had to get ready for work, right? Yes. You had to do all of this and sleep in the span of seven hours, isn't that true? Yep. Ms. Stone, you got very little sleep, right? I mean, less than normal, definitely. I want to make this clear, Ms. Stone. You got very little sleep. Did you not? As I said, maybe it was less than normal, but I was in good shape to work. Is I wouldn't have testimony, Ms. Stone, that you didn't get very little sleep? Objection. Objection. Ask an answer. I'm not sure it was answered, so I'll allow it to be asked again. Uh, you may re-ask the question. Is it your testimony, Ms. Stone, that you didn't get very little sleep? No, if you characterize it as very little, sure. No, but would you characterize it as very little? I, I would characterize it as less than normal. Okay, Ms. No. Stone, directing your attention once more to the affidavit. Please read um, the last sentence on page 74 through 75 to yourself. And then once you're ready, I'll be asking you the question. Yep. You got very little sleep, didn't you? I was a little tired, yes. Ms. Stone, are you testifying right now that you did not get very little sleep? I did. Sleep? I got less than normal. I got So you sleep. did get very little sleep, Ms. Stone? Yes, less than normal. Let's go back a bit further. Before you got this job, you've been unemployed since 2019, correct? Yes, that's correct. And I'm sorry to ask about this, Ms. Stone, but during this time period, you were struggling with alcoholism. Objection, right? Your Honor. Propensity argument. Can I respond? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'm not offering this uh, evidence to uh, prejudice anyone against the witness, uh, merely to lay a foundation um, for uh, testimony that will impeach your credibility, if you'll uh, allow me to continue my questioning. Your Honor, I do not see how these events in Stone's past in any way influenced her, day, her that day of the accident. As she testified, she's been sober for almost three years. 
May I be heard, Your Honor? Um, you may be heard and make a proffer as to where you're going with this. Yeah. Um, I intend to ask the witness about uh, an incident in which she lied to her supervisor about being drunk on site, which would impeach her credibility, her test her credibility, the credibility of her testimony here today, that she had not been drinking and was not on over the day of this accident. Ms. Hulad, if she lied in the past, wouldn't that be relevant um, cross-examination? Your Honor, again, this was a past job, and speculating that because she did this in the past, she would now do this in the present would be speculation as well as a defense theory. I will um, uh, not allow questioning about whether or not she had been suffering from alcoholism, but if you're able to elicit, elicit question, question, uh, testimony about her lying in the past, you may do that. Okay. You were previously terminated from a construction job, isn't that right? Yes, unfortunately I was. After a night of drinking, right? Objection, Your Honor, propensity argument about her drinking. I'll allow that question overall. This was after a night of drinking, right? Well, it was after work. Ms. Stone, were you or were you not drinking the night before this incident? Before what incident? The incident in which you lied to your supervisor about being drunk. Could you specify? Uh, Ms. Stone, I don't want to fairly prejudice the court against you, so I'll just ask you. But the night before your incident with Earl, you had been drinking, right? Unfortunately, I was, yes. And before you were terminated, Ms. Stone, your supervisor asked you if you were drunk, right? That's correct, yes. And you were avoiding your supervisor that day, right? Unfortunately, yeah. So they couldn't smell the alcohol on your breath, right? That's correct, I mean. Ms. Stone, when your supervisor asked you if you were drunk, you said that you weren't, right? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay about what the supervisor had asked. The statement is admissible as an admission of a party opponent. Your Honor, I do not believe your oh. supervisor would be yeah. in a party opponent. Sorry. We're talking about the supervisor yeah. previously. Uh, There's no statement being offered here. It's just a question. Um, I think this is not being offered for its truth, so I'll uh, overrule the objection and allow the question. Could you repeat the question? When your supervisor asked you if you were drunk, you said that you weren't, correct? Yes, that's correct. And you were fired this time for being drunk, right? Unfortunately, it was it was a really bad time in my okay, life. Okay, so let's go back to the accident. The floor was wet when you pitched the ladder you fell off of, right? I remember being a little wet, yes. You saw that the floor was wet, right? Yes. And made no effort to clean up the floor, right? I had a job to get done that day. I mean, I was instructed to take down drywall. So you didn't clean up the floor, Ms. Stone? Well, Marley was constantly, you know, rushing us to get the job done. Ms. Stone, that's all about the floor. you're on her bad during the witness. She didn't have time to finish her response. Well, I, I know that uh, we're running long on time here, but there have been some objections, so I'll, I'll allow a little more leeway, so just if you let the witness answer, so you may re-ask that question. Okay. You made no effort to clean up the floor, right? I couldn't. Ms. Stone, are you aware of the four to one rule? Yes, I am. I was you are. briefly made aware. You understand, Ms. Stone, of the importance of following the four to one rule and ensuring your safety, correct? Yes. Sure. You understand, as a construction worker, that the 4 to 1 rule is designed so that when you pitch a ladder, it doesn't slip, correct? I'm not sure about the technicalities, but I'm assuming it's for safety. Ms. Stone, you didn't use the 4 to 1 rule, did you? I did. I had pitched it like I had pitched the ladder every other day. Ms. Stone, directing your attention once more to your affidavit. The words 4 to 1 rule do not appear anywhere in your affidavit, do they? I didn't think it was necessary to include it. I mean, I explained why my affidavit is So, answering my question, the words four to one rule are not present anywhere in your affidavit, are they? Well, they're only present when I spoke about Free Swithers telling me about the rule. But, Ms. Stone, are you telling me that the words four to one rule do show up in your affidavit? Um, if you say they don't, well, I want to hear you say it, Ms. Stone. Do the words four to one appear at all in your affidavit? In what context? In any whatsoever, Ms. Stone. I recall saying that Reese Withers had told me about the four to one rule. Okay, Ms. Stone, please point me to that paragraph. Okay.
Respectfully, Your Honor, in paragraph 22 of the witness's affidavit, Ms. Withers clarified the witness to properly position her ladder. Um, Your Honor, my question was whether the words for terminal. So I'll, I'll allow the witness to answer uh, that question, but then um, I think we can move on to the next point. Would you like me to answer the question? Yes, please. I was referring to the fact that Reese Withers had told me to properly pitch my ladder. So that wasn't the question I was asking. I'm asking whether the words four to one rule appear at any point in your affidavit. That's what I was reference, referencing in paragraph 21 and 22. Ms. Stone, in paragraph 21 and the 22. The words do not appear, but that okay. is what I was asking. That, that is what I was explaining when Reese Withers. The words do not appear, Ms. Stone? No, they do not. No further questions, Your Honor. Is there any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Stone, how long have you been sober for? For about three years now. I was sober since January 2nd of 2020. What were you drinking the night of the party? Diet Colas. And when, if at all, were you made aware of the court warning? When Reese Withers told me I'd properly pitch my ladder. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Any uh, request? No request, Your Honor. The witness may step down, and the plaintiff may call their next witness. Yes, Your Honor. The plaintiff calls the code of strengths the same. I'll raise your right hand. And do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. <laughs> You may. Good morning. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the court? Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Dakota Springs. I'm 55 years old. Where do you reside, Ms. Springs? I live at 245 Hill Street in Gotham, Nirvana. And what is your current occupation? I am a union steward. Now, you mentioned that you are a union steward. What does this job as a union steward entail? It's my duty to be aware of my job sites and the treatment of my workers on the job sites. So I would be aware of any issues that would arise on the job sites of my workers. Turning your attention to the case at hand, how, if at all, are you acquainted with Remington Stone? I've known her for her entire life. I've known her parents since high school. You mentioned this personal relationship. What, if any, professional relationship do you have with Remington Stone? I've become somewhat of a mentor to her at work as well. How did this mentorship come about? I helped her get her career started. And why did you help Remington's career get started? I saw that Remington had the makings of a good worker. She could follow Objection, instructions. Your Honor. Move to strike as improper character and evidence under Rule 202. In which, what language, what testimony in particular are you? Objecting? That the plaintiff is a good worker. Respectfully, Your Honor, the witness is just giving her reasons for why she helped Remington get into the union. Your Honor, These are the observations that she made. Your Honor, respond. Your Honor, that's all well and good, but it's still improper character evidence under Rule 202. Given how central being a good worker is to this case, I will sustain the objection and strike that portion of the testimony. You may continue. Turning your attention to the night of September 22nd, 2021, do you recall this evening? Yes, I do. And what were you doing that evening? I was at a party that night. And where was this party? It was at Painter's Union Hall. And did you interact with Remington Stone at this party? Yes, we, we talked for a while. And while you were talking to Remington Stone, about how close were you to her? I was quite close to her. You know, we're very good friends. And during this conversation, did you have a chance to observe Remington Stone? Yes, I did. And from your observations, was Remington Stone drinking? Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. Your Honor, this witness testified that she had a conversation with Remington Stone, and she also had a chance to observe Remington Stone. And this is from her observation. The, the question was whether she was drinking. Wouldn't someone be able to make that observation? Your Honor, that's a central issue, matter in this case today, and I think, as you'll see, this witness does not have a foundation for making that assumption. So I assume the question, was the witness drinking, is referring to drinking alcohol. That Right, Mr. Chong, that's, is that the purpose of your question? This is from her observation. Okay. Um, I will uh, allow her to testify as to her observations and what she was seeing or otherwise observed, um, but not 
um, at least at this point, make any conclusions as to whether or not she was drinking alcohol. So uh, you may rephrase the question there. While you were conversing with Remington, you said that you were very close to her. What if anything, what if any signs of drinking alcohol could you have noticed? I was quite close to her. If she would have been drinking alcohol, I would have smelled it on her breath, but I did not smell anything. So from your observations, was Remington still drinking? She was not drinking any alcohol. She was drinking diet colas. Objection, Your Honor. Move to strike the speculation. The witness just stated that the plaintiff was drinking diet colas as a matter of fact. Um, I'll sustain as to lack of foundation for that testimony. I will allow the testimony that I don't think was objected to uh, as to whether or not any alcohol was smelled on her breath. Now, are you aware, as a union steward, who Remington Stone worked for? Yes, she worked for Acme Construction. And are you aware of what happened to Remington Stone on September 23rd, 2021? Yes, I am, I'm aware. And what happened? What are you aware of? I'm aware of her terrible accident at work. Now, turning to the investigations, are you aware of any investigation into this accident? Yes, I'm aware of Dr. Alexis Anderson's investigation. And how are you aware of this investigation? I spoke to Dr. Anderson about the accident and what I knew about Remington Stone as a worker. And what, if anything, did you convey to Dr. Anderson? I can to Dr. Anderson that Remington is a very reliable worker on the job site. Objection, Your Honor. As for my previous objection, I'd like to renew improper character evidence. Respectfully, Your Honor, if I may. You may. Counsel has strenuously brought up Remington's character, Remington's bad character, so it would be imperative that the court has an opportunity to listen to Remington, to listen to evidence of Remington's good character. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. My co-counsel didn't bring any evidence as to the uh, witnesses propensity to act in a certain way that was particularly avoided and only used to attack the witness's credibility in her testimony here today. So I will um, uh, overrule the objection with a limiting instruction that only may can be considered as to what she conveyed to the expert for purpose of the expert's opinion, but not but the jury may not credit that independently. Yes, Your Honor. Were you finished with your answer? I told Dr. Anderson that Remington was very good on the on the job site at following instructions and getting the job done on time. Did Marley Miser's investigator, Skylar Harris, contact you about the accident? No, I never heard from Skylar Harris. Now, earlier on direct that you mentioned that you're a union steward. How many years have you been working in the construction industry? I've worked in the construction industry for my entire adult life. That's been 25 years now. And how many, what's wrong? When were you elected union steward? It was my honor to be elected in 2021. From your experience as a union steward in the industry, would you be able to identify a safe working condition from a dangerous working condition? Yes, I would. And from your experience, is a live 220 volt electrical wire a safe working condition? Objection, no, it's your honor not. Calls for an expert opinion and lack of foundation. Isn't this? Go, go ahead, yes. Your Honor, the witness testified that she's been working in construction for 25 years. She's an elected union steward, and she testified earlier that her job as a union steward entails that she's aware of any issues at the job sites, including dangerous working conditions. May I respond, Your you Honor? May. This witness is absolutely not qualified to talk about the dangers of electrical wiring without expertise in that field. Thus, it's an, it's an opinion. Respect, respectfully, Your Honor, I'm asking from her experience, will she consider this a dangerous working condition or a safe one? I think it's a close call, but I do think this witness does have some specialized knowledge or qualifications that would allow a very limited opinion along the lines just offered, so I will overrule the objection and allow that, but uh, Mr. Young, probably not much more than, than this testimony. Yes, Your Honor. Were you finished with your answer? I would say that a live wire is very dangerous on a job site. From your experience, would an aluminum ladder missing rubber feet be safe? No, it would not be. How about a wet floor in combination with a ladder missing its rubber plates? That's not safe at all. And as a union steward, are you aware of any problems that arose on Miser's site? I'm aware of these very problems arising on that job site. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross examination? Yes, Your Honor.
Can I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning, Ms. Springs. Good morning. You've known the plaintiff for a long time, correct? Yes, I have. Since she was born, actually, right? Yes, that's true. And you're close with the plaintiff's parents, correct? I've known her parents since, since high school, actually. And you were even in their wedding party, isn't that correct? I was. And you consider the Stones family, correct? Yes, I do. And you consider yourself the plaintiff's guide parent, isn't that right? Well, I am, yes. And as the plaintiff's guide parent, you got her career going for her, isn't that correct? I recommended her to our union, so I was part of that. That's a yes, Miss Springs? Yes. And you did so as a favor to the plaintiff's father, isn't that correct? I did it because I know that Remington is a good worker, and I thought that she could be a good that's, part Springs, of That's, That's all well and good, but that's not my question. My question was, you helped the plaintiff start her career as a favor to the plaintiff's father, correct? Your Honor, ask and answer. It's also the counsel is badgering the witness. Oh, um, you may respond. The witness didn't answer my question. I was simply trying to clarify for the record. I'll overrule. I'm not sure there was a clear answer, but also, uh, please let the witness finish her answer. Sorry, Your Honor. Could you ask the question, please? Yes. You helped the plaintiff get her career going as a favor to the plaintiff's father, correct? That's not the only reason. I, I was notified by her father that she was looking for a job, but the real reason that I hired, what, that I Ms. recommended her. Your Honor, I would ask that counsel lets my witness answer the question. Um, oh, go ahead. The witness was narrating, and I moved to strike as non-responsive to my question. The objections overruled. I think at that point she went beyond the, the answer to the question, so the a motion to strike is granted, and you may ask your next question. You didn't think twice about this, did you, Ms. Springs? No, I knew she was a good person. And you also got the plaintiff into your union, Construction Locals 1212, correct? I helped her get in. But prior to kick-starting her career, you never worked with the plaintiff, correct? No, I was never, I never had a working relationship with her up, up to that point. And in fact, you didn't even look into the plaintiff's working history before you helped her, isn't that correct? No, I didn't. So to be clear, Ms. Springs, you're unaware that your own guide child was fired for lying, correct? Objection, Your Honor. This is far more prejudicial than probative and is also being offered by counsel for propensity argument. May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. This is absolutely not being offered as propensity evidence. In fact, it's being offered to impeach the credibility of this witness who's being brought as a character witness to attest to the, to the plaintiff's good character. May I be heard, Your Honor? You may. The, the witness testified that she was not directly involved in the hiring. She recommended the witness. So this would not go against their credibility. May I respond, Your Honor? Uh, you may. It absolutely does. This witness, you've heard this witness go on and on about her close personal relationship with the plaintiff. I'm simply clarifying that she has a lack of personal knowledge of the plaintiff. Uh, the objections overruled. The witness may answer the question. Ms. Springs, do you need uh, to have uh, the attorney re-ask questions? Yes, you? please. So, Ms. Springs, you are unaware that the plaintiff was fired for lying from a previous work site. Isn't that correct? I'm aware that she lost a previous job, but that was a while back. But you're specifically unaware that she was fired for lying about her alcoholism. Isn't that correct? Objection, Your Honor, to propensity argument concerning the alcoholism. Uh, sustained. You were elected union steward of June, in, of June in 2001, correct? 2021. 2021. Yeah. I apologize. And in your own words, you want your workers to know you have their backs no matter what. Isn't that right? That's my job as a union steward is to look out for my workers and make sure that they're being treated right. So that's a yes? Yes. Okay, Ms. Springs, let's move on and talk about the night before the plaintiff's accident. You attended a party with Ms. Stone on September 20, uh, 22nd, correct? Yes, I did. And at that party, you saw the plaintiff sitting by the bar that was serving alcohol, correct? Yes, she was there. And while sitting at the bar, she was drinking a dark-colored liquid, correct? She was drinking Diet Colas, yeah. Your Honor, move to strike a speculation. Your Honor, the witness was giving an explanation for and an observation for the counsel's answer. I'll strike the, the answer as uh, non-responsive. Uh, you may re-ask a question if you wish to. You saw the plaintiff drinking a dark-colored liquid by the bar. Yes or no, please? Yes, she was. And you spoke to the plaintiff at the bar, correct? We talked for a while, yes. Miss Springs, you say a while, but isn't it true that actually you only spoke to the plaintiff briefly? Yes, we, we talked. So let's clarify for the record, because you also mentioned this on direct examination and now again on cross. You only spoke to the plaintiff briefly, correct? It may have been. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact time we talked. It was a party. There were a lot of people there. 
Is it your testimony here today that your conversation with the plaintiff wasn't brief? It was brief, if you say so. Not, not if I say so, Miss Springs, if you say so. Yes, our, our conversation was brief. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And in that brief moment, you warned the plaintiff to stick to non-alcoholic beverages. Isn't that correct? I probably overset by reminding her, but it's become somewhat of a habit. But it was a warning. Isn't that correct, Miss Springs? It was more of a friendly reminder to her. So it's your testimony here today that it's not a warning? Objection, Your Honor. Badgering the witness. Can I respond, Your Honor? Um, overruled. You, uh, you, may, um, you may answer the question. It's your testimony here today that it was not a warning? It could have been taken as a warning, but I... I meant it as a friendly reminder. Well, I'm, I'm asking how you perceived it, not how the plaintiff perceived it. You warned the plaintiff. Isn't that correct? I can't say if I warned her or reminded her. In my mind, it's pretty much the same thing. You warned her because you knew that alcoholism is a disease from which one is never truly cured. Isn't that correct? Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative, and it's far more prejudicial than probative. I'll move on, Your Honor. Miss Springs, you left the party at 9 p.m., correct? I did, yes. And you didn't leave with the plaintiff, right? No, I did not. So you have absolutely no personal knowledge what the plaintiff was drinking after you left the party. Isn't that correct? I couldn't know that. That's a no, correct? I don't know what she was doing after I left. Miss Springs, you're aware of the plaintiff's history of alcoholism, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Propensity argument. Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. This witness, again, has testified over and over about her close personal relationship with the plaintiff, I am simply gauging how personal it was and um, probing her personal knowledge of the plaintiff's history. Testi testimony about Remington Scones prior alcoholism is only being offered by counsel as a propensity argument. You may I respond, Your Honor? You may. Yet again, I'm not offering this as propensity evidence, rather to impeach the credibility of this witness. So I understand um, your point, Ms. Laser, that uh, there's a different purpose for this questioning. I do think, though, I guess, um, unfairly prejudicial given the risk of propensity, so I will sustain the objection. I'll move on. This party was still going strong when you left, correct, Miss Springs? Yes, it was. And the last time you spoke to Remington, she was still sitting by the bar, isn't that correct? I believe so. And she was still drinking those dark colored liquids, correct? Yes, she was. Let's talk about Miss Stone's accident. You have little regard for property owners like my client, Mr. Mar Mr. Marley Miser. Isn't that correct? That's true. I believe that homeowners should not get involved in the work. But you blame my client for the plaintiff's accident. Isn't that correct? Yes. As I said, he got way too involved in the work. Move to strike as lack of foundation, lack of personal knowledge, and non-responsive. Your Honor, the witness was answering counsel's question. Um, I I'll deny the motion to strike and allow the answer. Would you like me to re-ask the question? Your Honor, I believe the question has been answered. Yeah, I, I think the answer is in the record, so you may move on to the next question. But in fact, Miss Springs, you've never met my client. Isn't that correct? I've never met Marley Miser. You weren't at the work site on the day of the accident. Isn't that right? No, I was not. So, Miss Springs, the last time you saw the plaintiff before her accident was 9 p.m. the night before, sitting by the bar. Isn't that correct? The last, yeah, I saw her at the party, yeah. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect, Your Honor? Yes. Ms. Springs, why did you hire Emma Stone if you knew? I knew that she was a reliable worker, and I thought that she could really be a good part of our union. And concerning the party, why did you warn Emma Stone about all? It's become somewhat of a habit. Thank you. No further reason, Director, Your Honor. Okay. Any recrossing, please? No, Your Honor. Okay. You may step down, uh, Ms. Springs. Thank you. And the uh, plaintiff may call your next witness. The plaintiff calls Dr. Alexis Anderson to the stand. your right hand and do promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. You may have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. Please introduce yourself to the court. My name is Dr. Alexis Anderson and I'm 55 years old. Where do you reside? I live at 3301 Commercial Avenue in Depew, Nirvana. 
What, if any, educational background do you have? I graduated from Purdue University in 1989 with my bachelor's in industrial engineering. How, if at all, did you further your education from here? I then attended the Northeastern University where I obtained both my bachelor's and PhD in industrial engineering. My dissertation was about improving workplace safety through the use of new technologies. So, do you work, doctor? Yes, I've worked for Taylor, Taylor & Associates, which is a firm that investigates workplace accidents since uh, 1998, and in 2012, I was promoted to senior investigator and vice president of the firm. What specifically does your work at Taylor & Associates entail? During my years there, I've conducted over 500 investigations into workplace accidents. This includes gathering information about an accident, giving a report, and then giving rem remedial measures to a company. Have you ever published anything before? Yes, I've written numerous articles for Safety and Health, which is the IOSH magazine, and I also wrote a chapter called How to Analyze and Diagnose Workplace Accidents in the textbook Accidents in the Workplace. Have you ever testified in a court before? Yes, I've testified as an expert over 150 times in both state and federal courts. And Dr. Anderson, could you describe for the court what industrial engineering is? Yes, in my line of work, industrial engineering is used as an umbrella term to cover really any workplace, so we investigate accidents in a broad scope of workplaces. Your Honor, at this time, the plaintiff offers Dr. Alexis Anderson as an expert in industrial engineering and analysis of workplace accidents. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Your dissertation was titled, permission to volunteer? Oh, yeah, I'll allow a voir dire the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Your dissertation was titled, Improving Workplace, Workplace Safety Through Intelligence Systems Design, correct? Yes, which was about improving workplace safety through new technology. Yeah. Can you just explain for the court what intelligence systems design is? So that's using new technologies like AI and uh, robotics and things like that to make the workplace more safe. Okay. No objection, Your Honor. Okay. Um, I'll um, accept the witness as an expert in industrial engineering and the workplace um, well, analysis of workplace accidents. Yeah. Analysis of workplace accidents. Thank you. So, Dr. Anderson, how did you become involved in today's case? I was contacted on October 2nd of 2021 by the attorneys of, of Remington Stone to investigate the accident for them. So, did you investigate the accident? Yes, I ran an investigation from October 4th to the 6th. This included interviews of Marley Miser, the homeowner, Remington Stone, the injured worker, and Dakota Springs, the union steward. What else did your investigation include? On October 5th, I paid a visit to the site of the accident and was able to inspect the work area. So through your visit there, could you describe the scene of the accident? Yes, the floor in the room which Remington was working in was old vinyl flooring, and when this gets wet, it becomes very slippery. And the ladder which Remington was provided with lacked rough footing and was aluminum. Dr. Anderson, as an expert, would you be familiar with the rules and regulations Surrounding workplace safety? I would. Are there any pertinent regulations to this case? Yes. As Remington was using a straight ladder, the 4 to 1 rule would apply. Could you briefly describe to the court what the 4 to 1 rule is? The 4 to 1 rule tells a user of a straight ladder to pitch it at a 75 degree angle, which just basically means is that for every four feet of rise, the ladder should be one foot away from the wall, and also says that all straight ladders should have rubberized footings to prevent slippage. So, in your expert opinion, would adherence to the 4 to 1 rule have prevented this accident? In this case, it would not have. Why not? Because the ladder lacked rubber footings and the floor was wet at the time of the accident, the ladder would have slipped regardless how Remington would have pitched it. Through your investigation of the accident, what, if any, written reports did you produce? As I do after every investigation, I created an accident investigation report. Your Honor, at this time, permission to approach the bench to retrieve what has previously been marked identification as plaintiff's one. You may. Thank you. Thank you. You may. Let the record reflect that I'm handing Dr. Anderson what has previously been marked as plaintiff's one. Doctor, do you recognize this document? I do. What do you recognize it to be? It is the accident investigation report about injured person Remington Stone. Is it a true and accurate copy of the document? Yes, it is. And is that your signature at the end? Yes. 
Did you make this in the regular course of your business? Yes, I create a document like this after every investigation that I can complete. I answer the same questions and such. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Permission to approach the bench, Your Honor? You may. I move this document into evidence as plaintiff's exhibit one as a business record. Ms. Barthes? Uh, Your Honor, we object to this document being admitted because it's hearsay and it was not created in the regular course of business. It was created for litigation purposes. Maybe you heard, Your Honor? Yeah. This is a report, and as Dr. Anderson testified, he makes such documents after every accident he investigates. Therefore, it would fall under an exception to hearsay, Rule 404, and that is a business record. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Your Honor, this accident reconstruction report was created specifically for this case, for this litigation, and therefore it does not, the exception of uh, business records does not apply in this case. Um, isn't that right? Isn't this uh, uh, something different than a traditional business record here? Respectfully, Your Honor, under the business record rule, uh, reports are one of the mentioned items, and Dr. Anderson creates one of these and answers the same questions that he answered after every single one of his investigations. Have you established that it was made at or near the time of the act that the witness perceived in the report? I could lay more foundation for that if you would like. Um, I'll allow you to try to lay more foundation for now. The objection is sustained. Yes, Your Honor. May I approach the witness? Dr. Anderson, when did you create this report? I created this report um, during my investigation of the accident. And when was your investigation? Um, the October uh, 4th to the 6th. And was this near the time of the accident? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, I offer this into evidence as plaintiff's exhibit one. Ms. Barbie, do you have any further objections? Your Honor, I stand by my objection. Um, I will sustain the objection and not receive the report as an exhibit. I will allow the witness to testify as to the conclusions in the report, but I do think it, it is hearsay and doesn't fall under the business records exception. If uh, the witness needs to be refreshed as to contents of the report, you may use the report to refresh his, his recollection. So, Dr. Anderson, in your report, you mentioned a 220 volt wire. Why did you find this necessary to include? Remington's burns were caused by coming into contact with this wire. And what did you conclude about this? A 220 volt line should never be left on on an active job site, especially during drywall demolition. This should have been turned off by the homeowner or the general contractor. And through your investigation, did you reach any other conclusions within a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? I did, yes. What were these conclusions? I concluded that the accident was caused by a combination of a few factors, one being the wet, slippery floor and the other being the fact that the ladder lacked rubber fittings. These two factors caused the ladder to slip and fall onto a 220 volt line, which never should have been left on. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I have no further questions. Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, may I proceed? You may. Good morning, Dr. Anderson. Good morning. You're being paid a lot of money to be here today, right? I, I'm an expert, yes. So you're being paid a lot of money to be here today, right? I'm being paid the normal fee, what I get for testifying in court. So, so just to be clear, you're being paid $1,000 for every hour you spend in this courtroom, correct? Well, that money doesn't come to my pocket. That goes to the firm that I work for. I am paid salary by that firm. Right, but your work, you're compensated for your work, $1,000 an hour for every hour you spend in this courtroom, correct? Section, Your Honor, ask and answer. Um, I'll allow a little more leeway. It's overruled for now. Would you like me to re-ask the question? Yes, please. You're being compensated $1,000 an hour for every hour you spend in this courtroom, correct? That I'm testifying, yes. Okay. You completed your entire investigation over the course of only three days. Isn't that right? That's correct. And you didn't see the ladder on the day of the accident, did you? I did not. I did see the ladder that Remington used. But on the day of the accident, you didn't see the ladder that Remington Stone used, correct? No, I did not. And you didn't see how wet the floor was on the day of the accident, did you? I did not see it. And uh, there were no videos of the accident that you could use, correct? Not to my knowledge. There were no videos of the accident available for you to review, correct? Not that were brought to my attention, yes. 
Okay. The accident happened on September 23rd, right? That's correct. And you went to the site on October 5th, right? Yes. So that's a week and a half after the accident, correct? That's correct. So you can't tell me today if the conditions a week and a half after the accident were exactly the same as they had been a week and a half before, right? Based off of my interviews, they were the same in regards to the same vinyl floor and drywall and ladder. But you can't tell me if the conditions a week and a half after the accident were exactly the same, right? Well, when I got there, the floor wasn't wet, but other than that, they were the same. Okay, okay I can make this more clear. You can't tell me if the amount of water was different a week and a half after the accident, can you? The water was gone a week and a half later. Okay. And you didn't try to reconstruct the accident, right? No, I personally don't put a lot of stock into accident reconstruction. So you didn't try to reconstruct the accident? I did not. So you didn't try to recreate the amount of water on the floor, did you? No, I did not. And you didn't try to recreate the angle of the ladder? No, like I said, I don't put a lot of stock into accent reconstruction. So that's a no? That's a no. And you didn't do any tests to see whether the angle of the ladder might be relevant, did you? I did not do any tests. And you didn't do any tests to see whether Remington's height and weight might be relevant, did you? No, I did not do any tests during the course of my investigation. Okay. You saw that the ladder that Remington Stone used was missing rubber footing, correct? That's correct. And to the best of your knowledge, there wasn't anything that would have made it hard to see that the ladder was missing rubber footings, right? Not when I looked at it. So to the best of your knowledge, there wasn't anything that would have made it hard to see that the ladder was missing its rubber footings, correct? That's correct. And you also heard from multiple sources that the floor was wet from rainfall, didn't you? Yes, I did. And like the rubber footing, there wasn't anything that would have made it hard to see, to the best of your knowledge, that the floor was wet, correct? Correct. Okay, let me ask you one final question. Workers should check equipment before they get on to make sure it's safe, correct? They should do that or ask supervisors for permission to use the equipment. But workers should check equipment to make sure it's safe before they get on it, correct? Like I said, either that or ask permission to use it from Is that a supervisor. Yes? They can do either of those two things. I can re-ask the question. Workers should check equipment to make sure it's safe before they get on it, correct? Ask and answer, Your Honor. Um, overruled. Would you like me to re-ask the question? Yes, please. Workers should check equipment to make sure it's safe before they get on it, correct? They should either do that or they should ask permission from a supervisor to use the equipment. No further questions. Okay. Uh, redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Anderson, why didn't you reconstruct the accident? I personally don't put a lot of stock into accident reconstruction, as if you miss one factor in the reconstruction, you'll be left with uh, false conclusions. You have to get it perfect, otherwise your reconstruction is useless. And opposing counsel mentioned a wet floor. Who informed you that the floor was wet? Marley Miser and Remington Stone. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Any uh, recross? No, Your Honor. Does the plaintiff, uh, oh, you may step down, uh, doctor. The Thank plaintiff you. rests, Your Honor. Okay. Hey. And would the uh, defendant like to call their first witness? Yes, Your Honor. The defense would like to call Mr. Marley Miser to Sorry, stand. Sorry, co-counselor. I uh, have one matter to attend oh. first. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, we recognize that this is an educational proceeding, but I'd like the rec record to, the, to reflect that the defense would at this time move for a directed verdict, seeing as the plaintiff has failed to meet any of their burdens of proof. Sure. Um, I'll take that motion under uh, advisement and um, may begin with the defense case, unless the plaintiff wishes to be heard. Respectfully, Your Honor, that would be improper, and we have not had the opportunity to cross-examine any of the defense witnesses. Yeah. I, I want to hear the defense uh, case as well, and the plaintiff uh, opportunity to uh, um, uh, cross-examine uh, the defendant's witnesses, and I'm happy to receive post-trial briefing from the parties if they wish. Um, I'm joking. I'm not going to take any. <laughs> You may call your first witness. Your Honor, the defense calls Marley Miser to the stand. Good 
Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning, Mr. Miser. Good morning. How old are you? I'm 78 years old. And what do you do for a living? Well, I've been retired for five years now, but most recently I was a building inspector for the city of Gotham. And before that, I was in the construction industry, building all kinds of buildings. Houses, apartments, offices. Where do you live now, Mr. Miser? I live in a house at 2597 Lancaster Road in Depew, just outside of Gotham. Do you own that house? I do. Can you describe the house to the court? It's an 125-year-old Victorian home, which was then converted into a two-family side-by-side duplex. I live in the right side and am currently renovating the left. Let's discuss those renovations. Given your experience in the construction industry, did you do those renovations yourself? No. I hired Acme Construction Company to be in charge of the work. Why'd you hire a contractor? I mean, look at me. I'm 78 and retired. I'm too old for this. Instead, I hired a company I thought I could trust. Who at Acme was in charge of supervising the work? Reese Withers. Now, Mr. Miser, you may have heard on opposing counsel's opening that you, and I quote, directed and controlled the work site. Did you also act as one of the supervisors? Of course not. I, I, I was the client. I hired ACME and signed a contract to do Objection, so. Objection, Your Honor. To legal conclusion and speculation, the workers may have perceived Mr. Miser as a supervisor. May I respond, Your Honor? Yeah. This witness absolutely has the personal knowledge to say whether he was a supervisor, and it would be wholly speculative for him to speculate on whether the workers perceived him as a supervisor. He's attesting to his experience. So I'll overrule the objection. I think the question was whether he acted as a supervisor. He can testify as to how he acted um, uh, at the job site. So allow it. Should I continue? Yes, Mr. Miser. Um, and I'm just, I'm too old for this. I don't want to be doing this work anymore. So did workers ever report to you, Mr. Miser? No, they reported to their supervisor, Reese Withers. So you also may have heard on opposing counsel's opening that you, and I quote, constantly gave Remington instructions. Did you ever give instructions to workers? No, never. I gave advice, but never instructions or orders. Okay, let's go back to those renovations. Can you tell the court what those renovations consisted of? Yes. New hardwood floors, taking out and putting in drywall, installing new windows, and rewiring the duplex. So how many workers would you say were on the project at any given time? About seven to ten. And are you familiar with a worker named Remington Stone? I am. Who is Remington? Remington was one of the workers on the site. And did you have a chance to observe Remington on the work site? I did. What did you see? Most days, Remington showed up to, look, to work. Um, with bloodshot eyes and tired. She was always irritable, and it seemed as if she hadn't slept the night before. And Objection, Your Honor, to the characterization of Remington Stone as irritable, and it would be improper character evidence. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. This isn't being offered as character evidence. Rather, the witness is simply relaying his observations. I'll um, overrule uh, the objection based on the testimony so far. Far, I believe the witness in the testifying to how what he observed of uh, Remington Stone. So I'll I'll permit it. And Remington always walked pretty slowly. So how did Remington respond to the advice you gave? Not well. About two weeks into Remington's time on the job, only two weeks before her accident, I was giving some advice to Remington when Remington responded to me verbatim, "Get lost, you old ninny." Let me do my work. Mr. Miser, did you fire the plaintiff for saying that to you? No, I didn't have the authority to do so. And I didn't push Reese to do so because I wanted to make sure the project was completed on time. Okay, Mr. Miser, let's talk about the night before Remington's accident. Did you see the plaintiff that night? I did, at the union retirement party. What did you see her doing? I saw Remington sitting at the bar knocking down drink after drink after drink. Remington, Objection, Your Honor. More prejudicial than probative, especially to the characterization of knocking back. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. 
the witness is simply relaying what he observed. He was at the party. There's a proper lay of foundation for this, and there's no character evidence being admitted whatsoever. I think knocking back is, is fair enough, um, uh, although, um, and I'll note, the witness did not say that she was drinking alcohol, at least not at this point, so I'll overrule the objection. Should I repeat my answer? Or? Um, I, I think uh, you don't need to repeat the answer. It's in the record, so you may move on to your next question. Did you ever see the plaintiff leave the bar, Mr. Miser? Yes, uh, once, to go to the bathroom. But as she was standing up, she stumbled. Someone had to catch her. And to be clear, did she stumble on a piece of furniture? I don't recall that. Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. There's nothing speculative about the witness's answer. He simply relayed an observation. Um, uh, overruled. I, I, the, the testimony was what he recalled seeing, so I'll allow it. What, if anything, did you say when you saw the plaintiff stumble? I turned to my friend Fred Williams, who was being honored that night, and shouted, I hope Remington's not driving. Remington is so loaded that Remington's going to run someone off the road. Objection, Your Honor. Far more prejudicial than probative, and also speculation as to Remington's condition. Ms. Leeser? Respond, Your Honor. Yes. The witness is relaying a statement he made in that moment, perceiving the plaintiff as it was happening. It's not speculative at all. It's the plaintiff's perception of the event. I think the first part of um, that statement might be fairly described as um, a... Um, uh, perception or present sense impression, but what about the second part that I hope he, he's not, that um, he's going to drive someone off the road or something like that? Why is that admissible? Your Honor, this statement's not being offered for its truth, and I'm, so the, my witness is eliciting that information to counter any claims opposing counsel might make that, he, that my client fabricated the story of the plaintiff's drinking after the accident in order to um, increase his negligence. In that case, Your Honor, it would be offered for its truth? So I will um, sustain the objection in part and overrule it in part. I will allow the testimony, I hope Remington is not driving, to be admitted, uh, admissible as, uh, under the uh, state of mind uh, exception to hearsay, but I will not allow the second part of the statement that Remington is so loaded that Remington is going to run someone off the road, um, and I'll instruct the jury to disregard that testimony. You may continue. When did you leave the party, Mr. Miser? At around 10 p.m. I wanted to make sure I got a full night's rest. And can you remind the court when the party was? The very night before Remington's accident. And did you see the plaintiff the morning of her accident? I did. When? At around 7.30 in the morning. And what did you observe at that time? I saw Remington exit her car with bloodshot eyes, looking tired. And she was walking slowly, as if trying to maintain her balance. Did you speak to Remington? Yes. I asked her if she was okay. And how did Remington respond to you? She responded to me snarkily. I'm about as good as I'm going to get today. Objection, Your Honor, to the characterization of snarkily. Your Honor, I'm happy to um, write that one word from The you. jury should disregard snarkily, so I'll sustain the objection. The rest of the, test, the, uh, rest of the answer remains in the record. Mr. Miser, what were the conditions of the work site that day? Well, the floors were wet. Do you know why? It had rained the night before. And why would that matter? Well, wet vinyl flooring can be slippery. And was the wet floor visible to the naked eye? It was. Okay, Mr. Marzo, let's discuss the ladder Remington used on that floor. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Mr. Miser, do you recognize that photo? Yes. This is my 12-foot aluminum ladder. Um, this is the ladder that Remington slipped on. Your Honor, at this time, we offer Defense Exhibit A into evidence. Your Honor, I object that this document lacks foundation and its relevance to the case, seeing as the creator of the document is not here, subject to cross-examination. It's unclear where this picture was taken and also when it was taken and whether it was altered since the, since the accident. May I respond? You may. 
this picture is wholly relevant to the case today. It is the ladder that the plaintiff slipped on. Second of all, this ladder was provided in the mock trial packet and in the stipulations, it is written that all evidence um, may be used at trial that's provided by the packet. So the, the, the ladder still needs to be uh, admissible um, uh, to evidence. What, what from his testimony established the admissibility of this ladder, of this photograph? I'm happy to relay foundation, but it was that uh, Mr. Miser talked about the conditions of the floor that day, and we are now talking about the ladder that was used on that floor. Given the witness, I, and, and he ad identified the photograph as the ladder, um, as his ladder, if I remember correctly, I will allow the admission. So exhibit um, A, was it, is received. You. And you may rely on it um, and, uh, as, as you wish. Where was this ladder, Mr. Miser? I had put it on a corner of my house. Do you know why the ladder was there? Yes, I was in the process of throwing it away and had put it in the corner to make sure no one used it. And did Remington speak to you in the middle of the day? She did, as I was rushing out of the house to run an errand. And what did she say? She asked if she could use a ladder in a corner, but I didn't know what ladder she was referring to. Is there Besides, it's not my job to provide a ladder. Objection, Your Honor, non-responsive. Um, I'll strike the second half of his answer um, and um, so I'll sustain the objection. Mr. Miser, was it your responsibility to provide workers' equipment? No, I was the client. It was Acme's job. Object to speculation, Your Honor. May I respond? As well as a legal conclusion. Okay, go ahead. Your Honor, as we've discussed in the objection about uh, whether Mr. Miser was a supervisor, Mr. Miser is simply attesting to his personal experience as to what he considered his responsibilities. I'll um, receive the evidence for that, that purpose, the objections overruled. Mr. Miser, was it your responsibility to provide workers with equipment? No, I was only the client. It was Acme's who was in charge of the construction site. So how did you respond to the plaintiff's request? I responded, whatever. So did you tell Remington to use that ladder? Of course. Of course not. Excuse me. Why not, Mr. Miser? Well, it wasn't my job to, prov to provide a ladder, and the ladder was in the corner to be thrown away. No further questions, Your Honor. Hmm. Recross, Ms. Mandel? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, before I proceed, referring the court to what has been marked for identification as plaintiff one, okay. would you like a copy of this? This is the witness's affidavit. Um, I, I have a copy here. Thank you. Approaching opposing counsel with a copy. We have one. Thank you so much. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning, Mr. Miser. Good morning. Now, as you mentioned on direct, you hired Acme Construction Company to renovate your house, correct? I did. And you said that one of the workers on the job site was Remington Stone. Correct. But, Mr. Miser, you didn't like Remington Stone very much, did you? No. In fact, you thought that she was completely worthless. As a worker, definitely. Now, you also talked about your experience, correct? Yes. And this is, you worked in the construction industry for 22 years. More than that, I was also a building inspector right. after that. You then worked as a building inspector for 30 years, correct? E exactly. So, Mr. Miser, it's fair to say you'd be able to recognize an unsafe working condition? Yes. Like, for instance, by using a metal ladder around live electrical wires to be dangerous? Yes, but I assumed the worker knew, and I was the client. It wasn't my job to tell Remington that. Your Honor, move to strike as non-responsive. Sustained. Honor. I'll strike the, um, the answer as non-responsive. Turning to the renovations on your house, you lived in the other half of the house, right? I lived on the right side of the duplex. Right, and the renovations were on the left? Correct. And you would go to the left side of the house and watch the workers, right? Yes, I'm retired. I have nothing better to do on the day. You'd give them helpful advice? If I could help, yes. You thought that they should listen to seasoned professionals like yourself? Yes, if it would help them. And it would. And you also stated on direct that you knew how many workers were on the job site? Yes, I and understand. at a certain point, you wanted more workers on the job site. Correct. I w wasn't sure if the project was going to be completed on time. And because of that, 
Acme hired Remington Stone, correct? Correct. And you state that uh, you would keep an eye on Remington Stone's work. Was the site supervisor, Reese Withers, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Opposing counsel used the phrase, you state, referring to an out-of-court statement. That's hearsay. And because the statement is not against the party's interest, it doesn't fall under any of the exceptions. May we heard, Your Honor? You, you may. According to Rule 601 on page 43, once an affidavit has been marked for identification purposes, it may be referred to during cross-examination. I will, um, I'll sustain the objection as to, as to form. Um, you may yep. re-ask the question. So you would keep an eye on Remington Stone's work for Reese Weathers, is that correct? Remington and some of the other workers, yes. And Mr. Miser, you even assisted in the installation of hardwood flooring at your house, didn't you? Yes, um, I knew it could be helpful to the workers and um, it would speed up the project, but I was the client. And in fact, you assisted in directing the work of one or more employees on the job site, didn't you? It was more advice. They were not bound to follow my directions. Sir, yes or no? You directed the work of one or more employees on the job site. I gave them directions that might be helpful to them, yes. Was that a yes? Yes. Your Honor, ask me, Mr. Overall, um, I think we have the answer. He said the answer was yes. Now, turning to September 23rd, 2021. You stated on direct that you were concerned about Remington Stone when she came to work that morning, right? Uh, I'm not sure if I stated that on direct, but given her state, I was a bit concerned. Did you stop Remington Stone from working? I did not. It was so similar to what I saw every other morning. So she came to work in exactly the same condition that she came to every morning? Yes. This day was different, though, because I knew what had happened the night before. I'm confused. You just stated that she came to work in exactly the same condition, and then you stated that it was different. Yes, because I knew what happened the night before. So, in fact, she was in exactly the same condition. She looked as hungover as she was every other day. Your Honor, move to strike as speculation. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. This is the witness's personal observation, and opposing counsel's line of questioning led to this particular place. Um, Res respectfully, Your Honor, yeah. state of hungover is definitely speculation. That is not an observation. I'm going to overrule the request to strike, but if you wish to follow up with the witness on his basis from, for that testimony, you may, but um, I believe it was a fair answer to the question, so I overrule. So you didn't stop Remington Stone from working, correct? No, and I regret it. And you also said that Remington Stone asked you to use a ladder. She did. And in fact, this was your ladder? Yes, and I responded whatever because I was busy and didn't know which ladder she was referring to. Well, referring your attention to the ladder in front of you, which has been marked as Defense's Exhibit A, this ladder does not have rubber feet, correct? Correct. This ladder is, in fact, dangerous to use, correct? I, it's usable. So didn't you say earlier that using a metal ladder around live electrical wires would be dangerous? I, yes, but that's really only if you fall and the ladder touches said wire. In fact, you simply said that using a metal ladder around live electrical wires is dangerous, yes or no? It can be a cause for danger, yes. Now, you allowed this ladder to sit on an active work site. I had put it in a corner that wasn't being worked on. So you put it in a corner of a room, correct? Correct. And you had planned to put it on the curb for trash pickup, right? Correct. But you just kept forgetting to do that. Yeah. And then when Remington Stone asked you to use a ladder, did you say no? No, I responded whatever, which was neither yes nor no. So you didn't say no? I did not say no. And you said on direct that you knew the floor was wet that day, didn't you? Yes, everyone could see it. Because it had rained the night before? Yes. And the windows were out? Correct. And you talked about your contract on direct with Acme Construction Company, and you hired them to replace the wiring in your house, right? 
Yes, but they weren't at that stage of construction yet. You also hired them to demolish the drywall? I did. And with your extensive experience in the construction industry, you'd agree with me that it's vitally important that the power is off when you're demolishing drywall, correct? Yes, and I'm pretty sure I turned off the power. You say you're pretty sure, but you're not certain, are you? No, I'm not completely certain. And it's fair to say it would not have been hard for you to check if the power was off, would it? Well, it definitely wasn't my job to. I was just a client. That was not my question. It would not have been hard for you to check if it was off? It would not have been hard for me or any of the other workers. And are you aware that Remington Stone's injuries resulted from her contacting a 220-volt wire? Yes, that's what I've heard. And Mr. Miser, you knew about this wire before the accident, didn't you? Your Honor, scope. No wires were mentioned on direct examination. Respectfully, Your Honor, this yeah. is relevant to the case. Um, overall, I'll, I'll allow the question. Will you repeat the question? Of course. You knew about this 220 volt wire before the accident? I did, and I assumed all of the workers knew as well. It's an old home, and workers should expect to encounter wiring behind the walls. So you assumed the workers knew this, but did you ever tell the workers? No, I was just the homeowner and the client. So you knew about the old and exposed wires behind that drywall as well? Sorry, Your Honor. Asked and answered. Um, overall. I, I, I was aware of them, but uh, I assumed the workers knew. Yet you never warned the workers, did you? No. Was my job to. In specific, you never warned Remington Stone about the 220 volt wire hidden behind that wall. No, I was just the client. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Miser. Did you feel the need to give reminders to the plaintiff on the day of her accident? No. Um, I was only the client, and um, especially after Remington had called me an old ninny, I had no reason or Objection, want to Your give Honor, any advice to her. Beyond the scope of cross-examination? Um, May I respond, Your Honor? Yeah. The door was very clearly open to this on cross-examination. I, I think it's close enough. I'll allow it overall. Would you like to finish your answer, Mr. Miser? I, I, I finished. Mr. Miser, was it your responsibility to provide equipment to workers? No. It was Acme's who was in charge of the construction site. And was it your responsibility to control workers and inform them of other things? Objection, Absolutely. Your Honor. Legal conclusion. I'll uh, rephrase, Your Honor. You may rephrase. Mr. Miser, can you clarify your sole role on this project? I was plainly the client. No further questions, Your Honor. Any recross? No, Your Honor. Great. Mr. Miser, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And the defendant may call their uh, next witness. The defense calls Reese Withers. Raise your right hand. And do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please have a seat. May I inquire? Uh, you may. Good morning, Ms. Withers. Good morning. What do you do for a living? I'm a site supervisor for Acme Construction Company. How long have you been working with Acme? I've been working with Acme now for 25 years, and then in 2016, I was promoted to site supervisor after years of hard work. Ms. Withers, do you know Remington Stone? Yes, I do. How do you know Remington? Remington is a construction worker that worked under me. And um, through what entity was Remington hired? He was hired through the local union, Chapter 1212. To your knowledge, did anyone else apply for Remington's position in the union? Yes. 
my nephew did, but unfortunately he didn't get the job. And do you harbor any ill will towards Remington because of this? No, of course not. I try to be fair to all my workers. Um, any ill will I did harbor towards Remington came later as a result of her poor work ethic. Objection, Your Honor. We'll move to strike the latter portion of the answers and non-responses. Uh, sustain. I'll strike um, the portion of the answer starting with any ill will I did have. Um, you may continue. What was your role on the Miser project? I was the site supervisor, so I was responsible for overseeing the project. Was there another person who acted as site supervisor? No, I was the only person who was a site supervisor, and I was contracted to do this job. What was Miser's role on the project? Miser contracted us to renovate his home. Um, he was simply the homeowner. All right, back to Remington. What were Remington's responsibilities on the job? So Remington was responsible for tearing down old drywall and putting up new drywall in its place. Did you ever observe Remington climb ladders in the course of performing these tasks? Yes, all the time. What did you observe? She always looked shaky when she was climbing ladders and bug-eyed. She... Objection, Your Honor. More prejudicial than probative. May I respond, Your Honor? May. Uh, the witness is just speaking to uh, the plaintiff's modus operandi. Uh, there's no uh, prejudice here. It's just She's just speaking to how the plaintiff conducted her work. Mr. Young? Respectfully, Your Honor, descriptions such as bug-eyed are not probative to this case. Um, I will strike, um, I'll, I'll sustain the objection uh, and strike the characterization, including a, um, um, the plaintiff being bug-eyed. But um, if uh, you wish to, Ms. Lebel, uh, Lebel uh, uh, elicit questions as to her observations of the plaintiff, I will allow that. Did you observe the plaintiff to climb ladders? Your Honor, ask and answer. Uh, overall. Confidently? No. Once again, she was always shaky when climbing ladders, and I told her that if she wanted to work in this industry, she had to learn how to climb ladders at the very minimum. So did you give Remington any other advice besides that on how to climb ladders? Yeah, I was always giving Remington advice, for example, to follow the 4 to 1 rule. What is the 4 to 1 rule? So the 4 to 1 rule is a Nirvana safety workplace standard, and it explains the ratio of the length of the ladder to the ratio of how far away it is from the wall. And if you use this rule, you're pretty much rock solid when climbing ladders. Did Remington ever fall off a ladder? Yes, unfortunately she did. What kind of ladder was Remington using when she fell? She was using some old aluminum ladder that she found with missing rubber footings. Objection, Your Honor. This lacks foundation. Um, sustain. Move to strike. Um, granted, I'll strike. Uh, I'll direct the uh, jury disregard that, that answer. If uh, you wish to uh, go in, um, down this road, uh, you need to lay a better foundation. Very well. Uh, Ms. Withers, were you on site during Remington's accident? Yes, I was. What were you doing on site? I was watching a window repair job on site. And what effect did any did this window repair job have on the interior of the site where Remington was working? So since we were doing window installations, the windows were out and it rained the night before, so water collected inside of the home. And did you see Remington after she fell? Yes, I did. Okay, so I'll re-ask. What kind of ladder was Remington using when she fell? Your Honor, I renew my objection. Her Counsel has not laid foundation for the fact that she was there. No evidence has come out. You respond, Your Honor? You may. Um, this witness uh, saw Remington after the fall, before Remington went to the hospital. And uh, aside from, and that's not to mention the fact that she was the site supervisor. And I'll, um, I'll sustain the ob objection um, because I don't recall her saying, and I apologize, I may have missed this, that she actually saw the ladder um, on that day. Um, uh, so I'll sustain the objection. Your Honor, move to strike? Granted. What was the condition of the floor on which Remington stood her ladder? Obje objection, Your Honor. Once again, I renew my objection. This witness was not at the side of the scene. She was watching a window removal. Uh, uh, Your Honor. You may. Um, the witness has just testified that she was supervising the window repair job, that the water sunk into the workplace. So to the extent you, you are able to answer that question and observe the floor, then you, you, may, you may answer it. The, the objection is uh, overruled. Um, yeah, so I was on site that day, and on site there was some water inside since it rained the night before, as I said. And was this water visible to the naked eye? Yes. Okay. 
Do you have any knowledge of Remington's whereabouts the night before her accident? Yes, Remington was at the union party the night before the accident. Where was Remington at this party? She was sitting at the bar the whole night. And what was Remington doing at the bar? She was drinking some dark-colored liquid. What time did Remington leave the party? Well, I left at 11, and Remington was still sitting at the bar when I left, and she looked like she was in no hurry to leave. No objection, Your Honor, to the characterization of no not leaving. This is completely speculative. Uh, may I respond, Your Honor? You may. The witness is testifying to her personal knowledge, within the bounds of her personal knowledge, her observation about the body language, whatever Remington was doing at the bar. I'll uh, sustain the objection that uh, uh, Ms. Noah was in no hurry to leave, um, but the witness may testify as to what uh, she observed on that day. Did Remington go to work the next day? Yes. And was this the day that Remington fell? Yes. Where were you when Remington fell? I was watching a window repair job on site, as I said before. What did you do when you learned that Remington fell? I instructed someone to call 911 right away. I know you were on site for Remington's fall, but did you ever leave the Miser construction site during working hours? Yes, occasionally. So part of my job was to oversee multiple sites, and the Miser project was one of them. So occasionally I had to leave and oversee the other sites that I was in charge of. And to your knowledge, was Marley ever there while you were gone? Yeah, I'm sure Marley was. I mean, he lived there, so he was around. Ms. Withers, did Marley act as your co-supervisor? No, not at all. I was the only site supervisor of this project. This is what I was contracted to do. Marley was the homeowner, and it was nice Objection, having... Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. This witness just testified that she was occasionally away from the site, but she would not be aware of what Miser did at that point. Um, Your Honor, if opposing counsel... Um, agrees that this witness testifying as to what Miser was up to while she was gone from the work site is speculative, then I withdraw the question and have no further ones. Um, so I'll um, overrule the, the objection and allow the, the answer. So um, uh, Ms. Uh, Withers, was your answer complete? Um, no. So as I said, it was nice having Miser around because he has a lot of um, experience in the construction industry, but I was only site supervisor of this project. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, before I proceed, I would like to remind the court that this witness's affidavit on pages 87 through 89 are marked by identification. Thank you. Permission to approach opposing counsel with a courtesy copy? You may. We have one at the bench. Thank you so much. May I proceed? You may. Good morning. Good morning. Now, you mentioned on direct that you've been working for Acme Construction for the past 25 years, correct? Yes, long time now. And then in 2016, I was promoted to site supervisor. Right. And you've been working as a site supervisor for the past seven years. Yes, as I just said. So it would be fair to say that you'd be well aware of Nirvana safety rules? Yes. But isn't it also true that as a site supervisor, you believe in getting the job done as inexpensively as possible. Yes, of course. I don't see a reason why I should have to charge ACME or the client extra money if unnecessary. Right. And this means that your workers do not have all the tools that they need. Yes or no? Occasionally, I allow my workers to cut some corners as site supervisor. I deem what's appropriate. Um, but I'm very adamant on workers following important Nirvana safety workplace standards like the 4 to 1 rule. Back to my question. Because you believe in getting the job done as inexpensively as possible, your workers sometimes do not have all the tools that they need, yes or no? Occasionally, but I'm very adamant on them following important safety workplace rules, as I just said. So that's a yes? Sometimes. And it's also true with Ron, Your Honor. Now, isn't it also true that as a site supervisor, you close an eye to sloppy work habits? As I said before, I don't believe there's a problem in cutting corners. Some people jaywalk if they deem it appropriate, but sometimes I do turn an eye or turn a blind eye to some work habits. So that's a yes? Sometimes. And you've stated that back in your day, you did the job despite the danger. Were those your words? Yes. I mean, nowadays, I don't really know what happens, but in my day, yes. Your Honor, move to strike the latter portion of the answer as non-responsive. Um. Overruled. I'm, I'm. And you've also said that we didn't want objection. Calls for hearsay. Um, 
Uh, let me hear the question first, um, and I'll ask the witness not to answer. But it's your belief that back in your day, you didn't cry like a bunch of cry crybabies about the safety risk. Any objection to that question? No, no objection, Your Honor. Um. Yeah, I think that in my day, people were more focused on getting the job done. Now, in August of 2021. Remington Stone came to work under you at the Marley Miser site, correct? Correct. And it's fair to say you didn't like Remington very much, did you? No, I wouldn't say that. I don't think she was a good worker, but I didn't have any personal relationship with her. Well, didn't you say that it was your misfortune to supervise Remington? Yes, so... Objection form. The, the question, in, as, it's, as it was stated, calls for your... Um, can you rephrase? Yes, Your Honor. You thought it was your misfortune that you had to supervise Remington, didn't you? As I said before, I don't think she was a good worker, and I don't think she was good at her job. Did you think, did you think that it was your misfortune, yes or no? Yes, I don't think she was good at her job. And you thought that she was a slug, didn't you? As I just said, I don't think she was good at her job, and yes. And in fact, you thought that she was a pain. As I just said, I don't think she was good at her job, and I didn't then. So it was misfortunate to have to supervise her. Now, isn't it also true that as a site supervisor, you assigned Remington the less desirable jobs, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it works in this industry. If you're newer, you start at the bottom. And you also said that you would not have been too broken up had Remington left and never come back. Were those your words? Yeah, Such but I... Once again, calls for hearsay. I'm overruled. Can I repeat the question? Yes, please. You stated that you would not have been too broken up had Remington left and never come back. Were those your words? Yes, once again, I don't think she was a good worker, but I would never do anything to jeopardize her position or try and get her fired. Your Honor, move to strike the latter portion as non responsive. Um, sustain, I'll strike the latter portion. Now, turning your attention to the homeowner, Marley Miser, you've described Miser as hell bent on getting the job done, correct? Yeah, I mean, we were hired to renovate his home, so he wanted us to do that and then leave. So that's a yes? Sure. Sure? Yes. And it's your view that Miser didn't want anything to interfere with the pace of work? Yes, as I just said, he wanted us to renovate his home, what we were hired to do. In fact, Morley Miser even assisted in the installation of part of the flooring at his house, yes or no? Um, I don't recall that. Well, would it surprise you to know as a site supervisor? Objection. This, this witness has been constructively sequestered. She can't answer this question. As it hasn't come up in the course of her examination. Um, get, yeah, heard John, you. you may. This witness is a site supervisor. I'm just asking if this witness is aware of this fact. In that case, Your Honor, this is calling for speculation. Um, I'll allow, uh, uh, rephrase the question. Um, I'll, I'll allow the question. I just want to hear it again. As a site supervisor, are you aware that Marley Miser assisted in the installation of hardwood flooring? As I said, I don't recall that. So you're not aware? No, I don't, I don't exactly remember that. I just supervise the site and my workers. Well, the reason you don't know this is because you were away from the site for extended periods of time. Objection, argumentative. Um, overall. Can I repeat the question? Um, no, it's okay. No, I wouldn't say that's true at all, actually. As I said before, I had to oversee multiple sites, but I was still watching my workers. Well, wouldn't you agree with me that if you're on a different site, you can't watch your workers on, a, on this site, can you? Yes, yeah, so this was part of my job. I was overseeing multiple sites, but I was still the site supervisor. That's what I was hired to do for this site. Is it your testimony today that you can watch the workers on one site while you're on a different site? I don't believe that's what I said. So, if you were away on a different site, you could not have supervised the workers on Marley Miser's site, could you have? Yes, that's not possible. Now, on direct, you said that you were away for, from the site occasionally, but isn't it true that you were actually away from the site for extended periods of time? Yeah, extended periods of time occasionally. So that would be, yeah, yes. Yes. And while you were away, Marley Miser served as your eyes and ears, yes or no? Yes, but I served as the mouth, if you will. I always gave the instructions. He kind of, it was just nice having him around, as I said. Well, it's true that 
you were glad that Miser was around, correct? Objection, yeah. relevance, how this witness feels about Marley Miser is relevant to the question at the heart of this case. Your Honor, this goes directly to the credibility of this witness. I'm allowed the question overruled. It's true that you were glad that Miser was around, correct? Yes, of course. I mean, he has years of experience in the industry. It was nice having him around. So that he could observe the work. And no, just because he has experience and it was nice having him around. Did you give an affidavit in this case? Yes. When you gave the affidavit, did you sure to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. And in paragraph 13 of the affidavit, didn't you state that you were glad Miser was around so you could observe the work? Um, as I just said, that's not contradictory to what I was saying, I believe. He observed the work. As I said, it was nice having him around. Because? So that he could observe the work. Yes or no? Sure. Sure? Yes. Not a yes. And you were also glad that he was around so that he could give helpful instructions to the work. Yes or no? Yes, but he wasn't giving any new information. It was just helpful tips and reminders, like to follow the 4-to-1 rule. And you thought that the workers should listen to seasoned professionals like Marley Meyer. Yeah, of course. He has years of experience in the industry. And you thought that Remington Stone in particular should listen to Marley Meiser, yes or no? Yeah, he would have been smart if he had, but he didn't. Your Honor, move to strike the latter portion of non-responsive. Um, sustained, I'll strike the last, or, or granted, I'll strike the last portion. Now, let's turn to the fateful day on September 23rd when Remington Stone was injured. Are you aware that Meiser met Remington as she came onto the work site? Objection, lack of personal knowledge. Your Honor, I'm just asking if she's aware. Um, over, overruled. This question, um, I'll allow. No, I, no, it's okay. Um, I was on site, so I don't really know exactly what happened with Remington and Miser at that exact point. Are you aware of this fact that Miser met Remington as she came onto the work site? No, that's... Did you give an affidavit in this case? Yes. And when you gave the affidavit, did you sure to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. And didn't you state that you were aware that Miser met Remington as she came onto the work site, yes or no? I mean, maybe they spoke for a minute or two, but I'm not exactly what happened in that conversation. Well, if they spoke, they met, correct? Sure, yes. So that would be a yes. Yeah. And as you just testified, Remington, Miser spoke to Remington, correct? I think so. I'm not exactly sure what happened between them two, as I just well, said. Didn't you just previously testify that they had a conversation? Objection, Your Honor. Improper foundation. Opposing counsel hasn't pointed to a specific paragraph referenced uh, any content of the affidavit, which is I'm just referencing the answers that this witness just gave. Um, over, overall, I may react to the question. Didn't you just testify that Miser had a conversation with Remington? Yes, but to be clear, I'm not exactly sure what happened in that conversation, so I can't really testify to right, that. Right, but they had a conversation. Nevertheless. Yes. But as a site supervisor, are you aware of anyone warning Remington about the live 220 volt wire? Objection. Scope. Um, Your Honor. Go ahead. This witness is a site supervisor. So whether she is aware of people warning Remington Stone about these dangerous working conditions would be very relevant and is within her scope. I'll overrule the, the objection as to whether or not she's aware of, it, of, of any um, um, statements along those lines being made. Sorry, your Remington. question. Um, no, it's okay. So as a site supervisor, at this point in the process, we were, Remington in particular was responsible for tearing down drywall and putting up new drywall in this place, so we weren't up to the wire portion yet. Your Honor, move to strike the entire answer as non-responsive. Um, that's granted. You may re-ask the question if you need to. As a site supervisor, are you aware of anyone warning Remington Stone about the live 220 volt electrical wire, yes or no? No, I'm not. As a site supervisor, are you aware of anyone warning Remington Stone about the faulty ladder? Yes or no? Objection. Argumentative. I object to the characterization of the ladder as faulty. Respectfully, Your Honor. It's come to the conclusion. Every opposing the, counsel has said this ladder was faulty. Uh, Your Honor, the faultiness of the ladder is in question and a the, central question. Of the the jury should Your disregard Honor. the word faulty, but you may. I can rephrase, question. Your Honor. As a site supervisor, are you aware of anyone warning Remington about the aluminum ladder missing rubber keys? Yes or no? 
No, Remington shouldn't need a warning. He should look at the ladder and determine for himself if it's faulty or not. Are you aware, as a site supervisor, of anyone warning Remington about the weather? All right, could opposing counsel repeat his question? I didn't catch the last word. About the weather? Go ahead. As a site supervisor, are you aware of anyone warning Remington Stone about the wet floor? Yes or no? No, as I said on direct, the floor was visibly wet. So you're not aware of anyone warning Remington about the wet floor? Yes or no? I mean, he's an adult. He can see a wet floor and determine for himself if that's safe or not. Is that a yes? Yes. So nobody warned Remington about the wet floor? Objection. Asked and answered. Um, Your Honor, the witness has passed. I'll... Um, I'll overrule the the objection, um, although I'll ask you to rephrase the question as to whether she's aware of anyone. Yes, Your Honor. So you're not aware of anyone warning Remington about the wet floor? No. For example, are you aware of Marley Miser warning Remington about any of these dangerous working conditions? Yes or no? No, Marley Miser hired us. That's my job. I'm the site supervisor. So that's a no? No. That's not a no? No. So Marley Miser did not warn Remington? No. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> uh, re redirect? Yes, Your Honor. May I inquire? You may. What personal bias, if any, do you have against Remington Stone? I have no personal bias against Remington Stone. I try to be fair to all my workers. And do you have any knowledge of whether Remington listened to Marley's instructions and advice while you were gone? He did not listen to Marley. He wasn't a good worker. He wasn't good at his job. No further Objections, questions, Your Honor. Speculation? Um, I'll, I'll strike the second portion of it, but... Um, I believe uh, the first half was uh, was responsive, so I'll strike the second half of the answer. No further questions, Your Honor. Any recrosses, John? None, Your Honor. Okay. You may uh, step down. Uh, Ms. Withers and the defendant may call their uh, next witness. Your Honor, the defense calls Dr. Skyler Hicks. Step into the box and raise your right hand. And do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You may have a seat. Your Honor, may I proceed? You may. Good morning, Dr. Harris. Good morning. Can you uh, please introduce yourself to the court? My name is Dr. Skyler Harris. Okay. Let's talk about school. What is your educational background? I hold a BS in Mechanical Engineering Technology from SUNY Albany, an MS in Mechanical Engineering from Niagara University, and a PhD in Fluid Dynamics from New York University. What is Mechanical Engineering? So Mechanical Engineering is the branch of engineering that studies the movement and the flow of objects and tools on the worksite, um, specifically the construction worksite. And duties include conducting field investigations and accident analysis. And can you please explain to the court what fluid dynamics is? Of course. Uh, fluid dynamics is the branch of mathematics and physics that's concerned with the description and the study of the flow of, op of liquids and gases. OK, let's talk about your work. What do you do for a living right now? I am currently a tenured professor and assistant dean in the industrial arts department at the University of Nirvana. Uh, how long have you been teaching industrial arts? Over 30 years. And do you do any work outside of your academic job? Yes, I have performed many accident reconstructions. What is an accident reconstruction? So an accident reconstruction is a reconstruction of the conditions of an accident in order to accurately determine what did or did not cause an accident. Have you ever published any work on the subject of accident reconstruction? Yes. In 2018, I co-authored a textbook titled Accident Reconstruction, Theory, and Practice. And have you ever testified in court before? Yeah, many times. I have served as an accident reconstruction expert in dozens of cases. And do you get paid for your expert witness work? Yes. Were you paid in connection with this case? Yes. Who originally paid you for your work in this case? Acme, but they're no longer a party. So who's paying you now? Marley Miser, the defendant. And do you have any pre-existing relationship with Mr. Miser? No. 
And does your compensation today at all depend on the outcome of this case? No. Okay, Your Honor, based on Harris, Dr. Harris's qualifications, we would like to offer her as an expert witness in accident reconstruction and analyzing workplace accidents. Okay. Permission to conduct a brief audit here? You may. As you stated, your main degrees were in mechanical engineering? Yes, correct. And you are a professor in the industrial arts department of the university? Yes, the industrial arts department is a larger, more umbrella term for the field, for a larger field. Your Honor, I object to this witness's lack of qualifications. While she may have qualifications in industrial settings, this is a residential construction site. Therefore, I think that her, her expertise is out of alignment with the case today. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Uh, Your Honor, despite the setting in which this case may have happened, it still pertains to construction, to construction equipment, which is all related to industrial. Um, I think when Dr. Harris says industrial, she really means um, construction and work sites and places where work takes place. This was not a house. This was a construction site. Um, and so absolutely, Dr. Harris's qualifications are relevant to this case. Let me just ask, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to ask, uh, establish those questions, those, um, that expertise from the witness. Um, uh, so I will uh, defer ruling on the objection pending a few more questions. Okay. So um, what did you get your degrees in in school? I got them in mechanical engineering and fluid dynamics. And can you explain how that might be relevant uh, to the case at hand today? Of course. Mechanical engineering is a study of, movement, of, study of the movement of objects and tools on the work site, ladders on the work site. Okay. And can you explain how, if at all, the fact that um, the site was, a res was um, initially a residential home would have affected the industrial arts portion of your experience? I don't see how it really has any effect whatsoever. Um, I can also explain the courses I do teach at the university that does relate to accident reconstruction and um, construction codes, if that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Why don't you do that for the court? So I've taught many courses on accident reconstruction, structural systems, um, Constru construction codes, yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, again, at this point, we would offer Dr. Harris as an expert with, as an expert in accident reconstruction and analyzing workplace accidents. Your Honor, I stand by my objection. Okay, I will um, overrule that objection and um, receive Professor uh, Harris as an expert in accident reconstruction and um, analysis of um, of of uh, workplace uh, accidents, so uh, she may testify as an expert. Okay. Let's discuss the details of the accident. How did you first become involved in this case? So a couple days after Remington's accident, ACME contacted me and asked me to perform an accident reconstruction, and then from there to form a professional conclusion about what happened. And did you form a conclusion? Yes. I'll ask you about the process in a minute, but let me ask you at the outset, what was your conclusion? In my expert opinion, Remington caused the accident herself because of her improper positioning of the ladder. Objection lacks foundation to how this witness formed this conclusion. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Your Honor, I'm just trying to make it clear for the court before we begin um, what Dr. Harris's opinion is. If you'd like, I can just include it at the end. Um, the objection's overruled, but without prejudice, I, I expect um, that the testimony will explain the basis for that conclusion. If it doesn't, then you may uh, revisit your objection. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, and how did you form your conclusion? I performed an accident reconstruction. Why did you perform an accident reconstruction for this case? Well, an accident reconstruction is the proper protocol. And also, an accident reconstruction is the single best way to isolate the cause of the accident, specifically what did or did not cause Remington's fall. So how did you begin your reconstruction? I began by obtaining a copy of Remington's medical report from the accident. And were you able to speak with any witnesses? I was. I, when I went to the site, I was able to speak with Reese Withers, the ACME site supervisor, and Marley Miser, the property owner. And what, if anything, did you learn from those conversations? I learned that rainwater had collected on the tiles the night before the accident because the windows were in the process of being replaced. Objection, hearsay. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Your Honor, experts um, are precluded from the rules about hearsay, so they can testify based on out-of-court statements. Um, this seems like the type of information that the expert would rely on, so I'll overrule the objection. Um, and what about Remington Stone? Did you speak to her? I attempted to speak with her, but her lawyers refused to give me access to her. And how, if at all, did that affect your investigation? 
Look, I would have loved to speak with Remington Stone, but it in no way materially affected my investigation. Because given my uh, given testimony from of Reese Weathers and Marley Miser, and given my thorough examination of the site, specifically the wet, uh, the wet flooring, the same ladder Remington had used, I was able to accurately reconstruct the conditions which underwent Remington's accident, therefore validating my accident reconstruction without testimony from Ms. Stone. So, objection, speculation. As this witness testified, she was not there on the day of the accident. Therefore, she could not know exactly what the conditions of the site were, and she cannot say that she did accurately, for a fact, represent those exact conditions. Ms. Farber? Uh, Your Honor, may I respond? Uh, I believe the question was just, to the best of Dr. Harris's ability, what effect, if any, that had on her investigation? Uh, overall, I think uh, the points um, uh, um, Ms. Hulia makes are, are valid, but are valid grounds for cross-examination. So I'll overrule the objection. So after speaking uh, with Reese Withers and Marley Miser, what did you do next? I then examined the ladder that Remington had used. And then what did you do? After that, I reconstructed the conditions of the accident. I took Remington's 12-foot ladder, and I poured water on the ground to replicate the rainwater. And what was your next step? After that, I positioned the ladder on the wet area using the 4-to-1 rule with the base three feet from the structure. What is the 4-to-1 rule? The 4-to-1 rule is a field-tested, expert-approved, comprehensive strategy that ensures that ladders don't slip. And the 4-to-1 rule states that when using a straight ladder, the base of the ladder must be one-fourth X from the structure, in which X represents the length of the ladder. And let me ask you a question. Even though the ladder was missing rubber footing, is the 4-to-1 rule still applicable in this case? Very much so. See, the last line that of the 4-to-1 rule that states that ladders should have rubberized footings is a mere suggestion, um, not a requirement, as evident by the should versus the must. Over the years, I've really come to call it the belt and suspenders approach. Really, it's this extra safety precaution. So one is extremely able to position the ladder um, using the 4-to-1 rule without the rubber footings and for it to be a safe ladder. Okay, and after positioning the ladder according to the 4-to-1 rule, what did you do next? After that, uh, I asked, oh, well, as I previously explained, I was able to obtain a copy of Remington's medical report. For the medical report, I learned that Remington is approximately 73 inches tall and 180 pounds. I then found a worker, again, with approximately Remington's build. I asked the worker to step on the ladder and make the motions. The witness cited specific statements contained within a document that is not in evidence. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Your Honor, uh, Admitting those documents, as we previously discussed, is hearsay. I'm just asking about um, the, the contents as much as the experts saw. I'm not quoting specific things. But I'm just discussing uh, Dr. Harris's process. And the other materials that she relied upon? Yes. Your Honor, if opposing yeah. counsel is saying the document is hearsay, then the statements the witness just said were hearsay as well. Your, Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Your Honor, again, experts are allowed to testify on reliance material, even if it otherwise might be hearsay. I'll, I'll overrule the objection and also instruct the jury that it's being offered for uh, to explain what the expert relied upon as opposed to independently for them to assess the, um, the truth of those statements. Okay, would you like me to re-ask the question? Yes, please. Okay, after positioning the ladder using the 4-to-1 rule, what did you do next? So, um, I was able to obtain a copy of Remington's medical report. From that exact same report, I learned that Remington is approximately 73 inches tall and 180 pounds. I then found a worker, once again, approximately Remington's build. I asked the worker to step onto the ladder and from there make the motions of striking a drywall, just as Remington had done. Why did you pick a worker who has the same height and weight as Remington's build? Oh, it was, it was um, proper procedure in performing a precise accident reconstruction. So what was the outcome of your reconstruction? The ladder didn't budge in the slightest. Why didn't the ladder move? Because I used the 4 to 1 rule, and the properly pitched ladder will almost never slide. And what effect, if any, did the height and weight of Remington stone play in this? Well, given Remington's size, the aluminum edges on a properly pitched ladder should have actually penetrated slightly into the vinyl, thus providing a stable base for the ladder even without the rubber footings, because the flooring was old and relatively porous. So what conclusion did you draw from your reconstruction? In my expert opinion, Remington did not 
position the ladder according to the 4 to 1 rule on September 23rd. And had she done so, she would not have fallen. Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. As this witness has testified, she was not there at the time of the accident. She can talk about conclusions based on her reconstruction, but not exactly what happened to Remy Constrain. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Your Honor, Dr. Harris has been qualified as an expert, so she's well within her right to, spec to, uh, to give testimony about things that she has knowledge about. And anyway, the conclusions she draw are all based on her reconstruction and her years of expertise. I'll um, overrule the objection and allow the, the testimony. Thank you, Dr. Harris. No further questions, Your Honor. Ms. White, uh, cross examination. Yes, Your Honor. Before I proceed, I will be referring to the affidavit of Professor Skyler Harris that is on pages 91 through 93. Okay. Thank you. We have. Thank you. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. You first heard about this case on September 25th, 2021? I was professionally aware of this case at that time. And you heard about it through Reese Withers? I was contacted by ACME. And you would be aware that Reese Withers is ACME's site supervisor? Y yes, I am aware of that. It's fair to say that you have a close relationship with ACME. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance? Your Honor, this goes to this witness's bias. As she testified on direct, she conducted her reconstruction on ACME's behalf. This goes to her bias toward ACME reconstruction. Um, overall, I'll allow this questioning. Can you ask the question? Yeah. You have a close relationship with ACME? Yes, I have worked with them many times. And you've also testified on ACME's behalf in dozens of cases? I have worked with them many times, that's correct. Your department at the university has also received a significant amount of ACME funding, correct? Yes, and I'm very appreciative. In fact, this has amounted to almost $2 million over the years? I really can't count over the years, but um, that might be it. Well, for example, this past year, it was almost $450,000 of funding. Ob I objection, Your Honor. Please instruct opposing counsel uh, to ask questions, not make statements. Um, uh, uh, overall, I think uh, the witness knows those are questions. Can you ask questions? Yes. This past year, it was almost $450,000? That's correct. And this money has funded much of your research, correct? Correct, but I would never let it affect my research. Is that a yes? That's a yes with what I just said, yes. And you said, and your department probably would not exist if this money had not come through? I wouldn't say it would not have existed. Um, there was a good chance it might have closed down with ACME's funding, without ACME's funding. Now, turning to the case today, when ACME contacted you, you agreed to begin an, an investigation? Yes, it was a job. For a discounted fee? Yes. It wasn't a complicated matter, really. Is that a yes? Yes. And you say in regards to ACME that they've been a good client of yours, correct? Yes, once again, I've worked with them many times. And you're also happy to help Miser in this case? We... I was happy to put my accident reconstruction at good use. So I didn't want this ACME, I didn't want Molly Miser to have to go out, um, get a new accident reconstruction expert to come up with the exact same conclusion that I have in my already cultivated accident reconstruction. Be happy to put it to good use. Well, you're happy to help Miser, who is ACME's customer, correct? Yeah, with my accident reconstruction, I'm very happy to testify in regards to it. So, as you stated, you created this accident reconstruction? Yes. And you believe this was a very strong reconstruction, right? I believe that it accurately reconstructed the conditions of the accident, yes. Now let's discuss the process you took for recreating the accident. You interviewed two witnesses? Yes, Marley Meisler and Reese Withers. Right, and you'd be aware that neither of these individuals were present on the site at the time of the accident? Yes. You would be aware through your investigation that there was around seven to ten workers on site on any, get, on any given day? Um, Objection, Your Honor. That's beyond the scope of the witness. Your Honor, this witness claims to have investigated this case, and this goes to her knowledge if she is aware. Um, overruled, if the witness is able to answer that question, she may answer. Um, there might have been, yes. 
But you only interviewed these two witnesses, correct? These were key witnesses in the accident. Would you be aware that both of these witnesses are testifying for the defense today? Yes, I am aware. You yourself only got on site seven days after the accident occurred? That's correct. So you cannot be sure of what happened during those seven days on the site? What I am sure is that I was able to accurately recon reconstruct the conditions of the accident. That's what an accident reconstruction is meant to do. That was not my question. You cannot be sure of what happened during those seven days on site? No. Now, it's fair to say that your reconstruction report focused mainly on the pitch of the ladder, correct? I wouldn't say mainly on the pitch of the ladder. Again, I was trying to reconstruct. I was trying to really determine that if pitched according to the 4 to 1 rule, even under these other conditions, would the ladder fall? And it didn't fall. Well, your belief is that the sole cause of the accident was Remington's inability to pitch the ladder correctly, right? Yes, I do not believe she used the 4 to 1 rule. Your Honor, move to strike. The last portion of my answer is non-responsive. Um, overall. There, you include nothing in your report about who was responsible for warning the workers about the unsafe working conditions on site. Objection, Your Honor. That's beyond the scope of the witness. Dr. Harris is here to testify on um, uh, the, the cause of the accident and not anything that might have happened after any working conditions on the site. Your Honor, this goes to the thoroughness of this witness's investigation. She claims that the sole cause of the accident was Remington's inability to pitch the ladder, yet she may have failed to consider these other facts in making her conclusion. I'll overrule the objection. You may re-ask the question. You make no mention of who was responsible for warning the workers about the defective ladder on site. I don't see how that pertains to my accident reconstruction. I was able to accurately reconstruct the conditions of the accident. Who had control over who the condition of the floor or anything? That really wasn't my area of expertise or really part of my accident reconstruction. So you're saying you did not consider this in making your conclusion? Is that yes? I don't think it was. What I considered was the wet, slippery floor. So you did not consider who was responsible for warning the workers about the live wire on site that day? Objection, Your Honor. Scope on two grounds. Again, that's beyond the scope of this witness, and the word wire was not mentioned a single time on my direct. Um, Your Honor, once I, again, this goes to the thoroughness of this witness's conclusions and how she came to those conclusions and how they may have been faulty. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Any issue with the wires happened because Remington Stone fell? What Dr. Harris is here to testify about is what is the reason why Remington Stone fell, not what may have happened after. How does the witness's testimony and expert opinions reach the wires as opposed to, as Ms. Barbier says, the um, why, why Ms. Uh, Ms. Stone fell? Because she claims the sole reason why the ladder fell was because of Remington's inability to pitch it correctly, but she didn't consider if he was ever warned about the unsafe working conditions before doing that. Your Honor, may I respond? You may. Your Honor, the question I'm objecting to is about the wires, and the wires were behind the drywall uh, where Remington Stone fell, and so any exposed wiring would have happened after Remington Stone fell. Um, I will uh, sustain the objection based on the uh, questioning about the, the wires. I think that could result in some confusion here, um, uh, so we may move on. You do agree that unsafe working conditions existed at the job site? There were some suboptimal conditions, but of course it did not hinder Remington's ability to properly position the ladder. But in regards to the live wire, you believe such a power source is suboptimal, correct? I believe that does not correlate to my accident reconstruction. Did you give an affidavit in this case? Yes, I did. And in your affidavit, did you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. And in your affidavit, didn't you include the fact that a live wire on an active job site is suboptimal? Yes. yes or no? And I don't think my um, I don't think my answer contradicted that. But you included this in your affidavit. Yes. And you agree that construction code would require such a source to be properly labeled and dealt with? Look, I'm, I'm not a lawyer here. Um, that really isn't my area of expertise. Did you give an affidavit in this case? Yes. And in that affidavit, didn't you include the fact that such a power source should be properly tagged out and dealt with? I did say that, but again, it's really not my area of expertise. But you included this in your affidavit? Yes. 
you agree that that didn't happen here, did it? It did not happen, but again, it has really no bearing on what caused Remington's accident. Through your expert experience, you'd be aware it's important that workers are warned about such conditions on the job. Objection, Your Honor. Again, scope. This is beyond the scope of both my witness and my cross exam and my direct examination. Um, I'll uh, overrule the objection. I'll allow. Through your expert experience, you'd be aware it's important workers are warned about conditions such as this live wire on the job site? I think it's important that workers do their utmost to keep themselves safe. Is that a yes? It's important workers are warned? I think that they really should keep themselves safe. I think that it's their duty to keep themselves safe. If a worker is unaware of these unsafe working conditions, you'd be, you would agree it's important they're warned about them, yes? Once again, I really think that a worker who is on the site should do their utmost to keep themselves safe. Right, but in this case, you mentioned no warning given to Remington Stone about the live 220 volt wire. Well, see, I was only here to reconstruct the conditions of the accident, not the injury. Is that a yes? You include no warning given to Remington Stone about this live wire. Yes, it was. Your Honor, scope and ask and answer. Um, I'll allow the question one more time. Yes, but it was a conditional yes. Is that a yes? Yes, based on what I explained before. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Redirect? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Is ACME a party in this case anymore? No. Okay. On cross, you were asked a lot about um, some things that you didn't investigate, like the wires and the unsafe working conditions. Can you explain why that wasn't part of your work? What was part of my work, what did I, I believe I explained on direct, what I was trying to determine is if pitched according to the 41 rule, would the ladder fall? I was only here to reconstruct the main conditions of the accident. And let me ask you another question. On cross, you were asked a lot about who might have been warned about certain conditions. Does that warning have anything to do with your testimony or um, the cause of this accident? No, that's really, again, not my area of expertise. I, what I did learn was that the floor was wet, that uh, the floor was wet, that there was a ladder without rubber footings. I reconstructed those conditions, trying to determine that if positioned according to the 4 to 1 rule, did the ladder slip? It did not. Therefore, that's my entire accident reconstruction. That's what I'm here to testify in regards to. Thank you, Dr. Harris. No further questions, Your Honor. Any recross? Yes, Your Honor. You say that the sole cause of the accident was the ladder, correct? The improper positioning. That's correct. But you mentioned no warning about if Remington knew the ladder was defective. I'd say that the ladder did not have rubber footings. Defective means that it wouldn't be able to be positioned, it wouldn't be safe when positioned properly. And that's just really not the case. You were not aware if Remington knew it was missing its rubber footings? I don't see how that has any correlation to my accident reconstruction. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Um, Professor, you may uh, step down. Thank you. Does the defendant have any further witnesses? Uh, no, Your Honor, the defense rests. Okay. Um, we'll take a break before closing arguments. I will do another about a 10-minute break. And who will be closing for the, uh, for the parties? I will be, Your Honor. I'll be doing it for the plaintiff. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll hear from uh, the uh, defendant first, Mr. Lee Wolf. May I proceed? You may. May it please the court. As my colleague told you right at the beginning of this trial, this is a case about personal responsibility. If a cook grabs hold of a hot pan when the flames on the burner are plainly visible, they can't blame the restaurant after burning their fingers. If someone tries to leap across a subway track, they can't pin the blame on the city after getting hit by a moving train. In this case, the plaintiff did something equally negligent. After a night of heavy drinking, 
she took a defective ladder and placed it at an unsafe angle on a slippery wet floor. Something no careful worker would have done. The plaintiff is now trying to pin the blame on Marley Miser, a 78-year-old retiree. However, Ms. Stone's own contributory negligence requires a judgment in Mr. Miser's favor. The case the plaintiff is trying to prove has a lot of holes. They fail to prove that Marley Miser had the authority to supervise the plaintiff's work. As the evidence showed, Reese Withers was the only supervisor. The plaintiff further failed to prove that Marley failed to keep the work environment safe. That was ACME's responsibility and the workers and their common sense. The plaintiff further failed to prove that any unsafe work conditions caused the plaintiff's injuries. Her injuries were caused by her own failure to position the ladder correctly. But before I get to the deficiencies in the plaintiff's case, I first want to talk about the legal standard that undermines their entire case, contributory negligence. Nirvana is a, uh, is a um, common law contributory negligence state. That much is clear, which means if the plaintiff is found to have contributed by even 1% to her accident through her negligence, she must be found liable. Today, the defense has proven by a preponderance of the evidence the plaintiff was contributorily negligent. The story of the plaintiff's contributory negligence begins the night before her accident at a party the plaintiff attended. You heard multiple witnesses testify that the plaintiff sat at the bar all night long, knocking back drink after drink, and that when the plaintiff got up from the bar, she stumbled. Furthermore, the plaintiff not once asked the bartender for a Diet Coke, instead asking for the usual. When the plaintiff showed up to work the next morning, tired, she was still stumbling, and her eyes were still bloodshot. In her own words, she told her colleagues at work that she was about as good she was going to get that day. This evidence all proves that the plaintiff had clearly been drunk and was obviously hungover the day of her accident. Who says otherwise? Only the plaintiff herself and Dakota Springs, her parents' best friend. Dakota Springs' belief that the plaintiff wasn't drinking amounts to blind faith. As for the plaintiff, she can offer you only her word. But by the way, you don't even need to determine that the plaintiff was drunk to find her contributorily negligent. Because at a minimum, she was sleep deprived. The fact that the plaintiff does not dispute. She's admitted that she went to a party, left at 12.30 in the morning, and showed up to work very tired, seven hours later. By virtue of being sleep deprived alone, the plaintiff was contributorily negligent. Everything the plaintiff did at work that day, grabbing the ladder, setting up the ladder at the wrong angle, climbing the ladder, and falling, she did with impaired cognitive function, brought on by her choice to stay out too late. How else do you know the plaintiff was contributorily negligent? Despite the missing rubber feet of the ladder she chose to use and the wet floor of the, on which she stood the ladder, we've heard from expert witness Skylar Harris that if the plaintiff had only positioned the ladder properly, with the four to one ratio required by the state of Nirvana's workplace safety rules, the plaintiff would have remained safe. Dr. Harris is an expert in her field. She's done dozens of accident reconstructions. She replicated the conditions of the accident with the same floor, the same ladder, and a worker of proportions similar to Remington. Dr. Harris found that the ladder the plaintiff used would not have slipped despite the wet conditions the plaintiff had used the four to one way. Now, the plaintiff expects you to believe that she forgot to include this detail concerning her use of the four to one rule in her affidavit. But your honor, the plaintiff herself has testified that she understands its importance in ensuring her safety. And this question is central to the case. Surely if the plaintiff had used the rule, she would have mentioned it. Now the plaintiff brought their own expert in Alexis Anderson to try and refute Dr. Harris's claims. But even though Anderson is being paid 10 times as much as Dr. Harris to testify, he never actually reconstructed the accident. His opinion is nothing more than ipsy dixit, or say so. His lackluster investigation and high price tag 
are sufficient reasons for you to disregard an opinion. For all these reasons, we have proven by preponderance of the evidence that the plaintiff was contributorily negligent. But I'd also like to review the evidence that demonstrates that Marley Miser was not at fault here. The plaintiff has tried to argue that Marley Miser had the authority to supervise the plaintiff's work, calling him controlling and omnipresent. But Your Honor, the plaintiff's own behavior proves otherwise. She's admitted that whatever advice Marley may have offered, she certainly didn't listen to it. She told him once to get lost, you old man, clearly rejecting his help. The plaintiff didn't care about Marley's input, which is why she cannot prove her claim that he was her supervisor. The plaintiff would like you to hang the entirety of this case around Marley's neck based on one word, whatever. They've tried to argue that Marley instructed Remington to use the ladder off of which he fell because of this one word. But whatever is not the same as yes. And Marley didn't say yes because Marley wasn't the plaintiff's supervisor. He clearly received the message from the plaintiff that she was not interested in his advice. As for the plaintiff's claim that Marley failed to keep the work premises safe, the only basis for their argument is that the ladder was missing rubber feet and the floor was wet. But Dr. Harris's testimony alone refutes that claim. The one factor that mattered was whether Remington used the four to one rule or not. The wiring would never, would never have been an issue if Remington had just positioned the ladder correctly. But even if the environmental conditions did matter in the plaintiff's accident, it wasn't Marley's fault that the floor was wet. Reese Withers, the site supervisor, had taken the windows out, and it rained overnight. And on that subject, any, amiss, any missing equipment that the plaintiff has tried to argue compelled her to use the aluminum ladder is the fault of Reese Withers and Acme, not Marley. As for Marley's relationship towards the ladder, he put it in the corner because he was about to throw it out. Its defects were open and obvious, yet Remington made no effort to inspect them before she climbed the ladder. No worker in their right mind would have used the ladder. As we've heard today, though, the plaintiff was not in her right mind and shouldn't have come to work. In fact, the plaintiff should never have been working on the construction site. She's admitted that she'd been hungover on a previous site, and when questioned about her drinking, lied to her supervisor about it. Though she's testified today that she had not been drinking and was not hungover the day of this accident, her history of lying about drinking calls into serious question the credibility of her testimony. Furthermore, Dakota Springs made no effort to investigate this incident when she hired Remington as a favor to her parents. A worker with a history like Remington does not belong on a construction site. In sum, plaintiff's case fails for four reasons. One, Marley wasn't the plaintiff's supervisor. Two, even if Marley were the plaintiff's supervisor, the site was not kept in an inherently unsafe condition. And three, even if the site had been kept in an unsafe condition, that wasn't the cause of the plaintiff's injuries. And four, the defense has proved overwhelmingly that the plaintiff contributed to her accident through her own negligence. The plaintiff has conceded that she stayed out late, and we have additionally proved that she was drinking. The plaintiff has conceded that she showed up to work tired, and we have additionally proved that these symptoms, including her stumbling and red eyes, were caused by a hangover. And also, we have proved that the plaintiff failed to use the four to one rule when she positioned her ladder the only thing she had to do to keep herself safe. We therefore ask that you return the only ruling consistent with the evidence, a judgment in favor of the defendant. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, your honor, as we stated at the outset of this trial, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Those words were true when Ben Franklin said them, and they hold true today. Under Nirvana's labor laws, Miser should have provided adequate 
and reasonable protection to invitees in his home. It could have been so easy for Miser to provide just that ounce of prevention needed in this case, but he did not. And as a result, my client suffered life-altering injuries. Firstly, during work that Miser was involved in supervising at his home, and secondly, because Miser allowed dangerous workplace conditions to persist and fail to remedy those conditions in a timely manner. Either of these, Your Honor, is sufficient for recovery against the defendant, but here, both were satisfied. The defendant has made much ado about the manner in which the work was performed and even tried to shift the blame to the workers themselves, the very people that Labor Law Section 200 is intended to protect. But, Your Honor, don't let all that huffing and puffing cloud the real issue of who is responsible, both on the facts and as a matter of law. The bottom line is, Miser inserted himself into directing and controlling the work, directly caused and knew of unsafe working conditions at the site, and failed to take adequate or reasonable steps to remedy against those conditions. Miser is not absolved of responsibility here. Under Labor Law Section 200, a homeowner has a general non-delegable duty to protect the employees on the job site. Your Honor, as my co-counsel pointed out at the outset of this trial, the idea of contributory negligence is a red herring. Your Honor, nowhere in the case is the definition or is it ever talked about contributory negligence? That does not absolve Miser of his responsibility under Labor Law Section 200. It is simply not an issue in this case. Now, Your Honor, let's review the evidence that we heard today. Starting with the question of control. You heard how Miser took numerous steps to control the project. First of all, Miser was on site more than even Reese Withers, the named site supervisor. You heard testimony from Remington Stone that Miser was always telling her what to do and was on the site on a daily basis. Miser was quite critical of what the workers were doing and was controlling the project. As you heard Miser admit, he had extensive industry experience and he was using his experience to direct the work. You even heard him admit that he was involved in the project himself, in installing hardwood floors. Not only that, Your Honor, you heard him admit today that he was involved in directing one or more employees on the site. Miser was directing the course of the project and was always pressing the workers to get the job done on time. Now, let's talk about whether Miser failed to deal with unsafe working conditions at the site. The chief evidence, Your Honor, came from Miser himself. You heard him admit that he had control over numerous factors that contributed to the accident. Let's consider them. First of all, Miser kept a defective ladder on the job site. You heard him admit today he knew it was defective. He even intended to throw it out. Yet, he allowed it to sit on an active job site knowing it was available to any employees on the site. And when workers such as Remington Stone asked permission to use the ladder, Miser never warned them not to or told them that it was a bad idea. Not only that, Your Honor, Miser never dealt with the wet floor on site, today, on site that day. You heard how Miser was aware of this wet floor, yet he took no steps to either warn Acme Construction or the workers themselves, let alone to deal with it himself. Most importantly, Your Honor, Miser did not take any steps to deal with that live 220 volt wire that caused Remington Stone's injury. Your Honor, that was voltage powerful enough to kill somebody. But Miser did nothing about it. Miser cannot even confirm that he ever turned the power off. He 
He never warned anybody on site. And he never warned the workers themselves, such as Remington Stone. You heard Remington testify how she was never warned about this live wire on site that day. Your Honor, under Hover versus Steele, it doesn't matter that Remington may have noticed some of these unsafe working conditions at the site. This law still requires that the homeowner maintain the premises in a reasonable degree of safety. Now, Your Honor, the defense today has tried to paint this accident as my client's responsibility, but that does not hold up in light of the facts. You heard Remington Stone testify she was unaware of the ladder or the wire that day. Much was also made about my client's duty, excuse me, my client's actions the night before. It's true, Remington was at a party the night before. Along with Reese Withers, Dakota Springs, and Miser himself. But, Your Honor, so what? No evidence has been brought in court today to prove that my client was drinking anything other than diet colas that night. The only evidence you did hear, Your Honor, was evidence that she was only drinking diet colas that night from Remington Stone herself, as well as numerous other witnesses. Opposing counsel claims that my client showed up the next day hungover, but that does not hold up in light of the evidence. You heard Remington Stone testify she showed up that morning in adequate shape to work at the usual start time. And that's where things went badly wrong, thanks to Marley Miser. Because the facts were not on their side, opposing counsel called upon their so-called expert, Skylar Harris. But as you heard, Harris's testimony was flawed, to say the least. You heard how Harris had a serious conflict of interest in this case. Harris's department at the university received millions of dollars of funding from ACME, the same company that Harris then went on to reconstruct the accident on behalf of. Harris had a serious bias, and as part of her reconstruction, she interviewed only two witnesses, neither of whom were present at the time of the accident. Harris then based her conclusions off the facts she got in those interviews. Harris had preconceived notions, was doing the defense's bidding today, and was not following the actual facts of the case. She claims the sole cause was Remington's inability to pitch the ladder correctly, but Your Honor, if Remington Stone had known about that live 220 volt wire, she may not have pitched the ladder in the first place, and Your Honor, she would not have sustained those horrible injuries if that wire was not there. You also heard opposing counsel today try to shift the blame to Acme Construction. But Your Honor, doing so does not absolve Miser of his responsibilities under Labor Law Section 200. He has a non-delegable duty. You also heard today from the plaintiff's expert witness, Alexis Anderson. You heard Anderson testify how this accident was inevitable given the defective ladder Miser provided to Remington Stone, as well as the unsafe working conditions, such as the live wire and the wet floor. Your Honor, even imperfect workers are deserving of basic safety protections on the job site. It could have been so easy for Miser to provide that ounce of prevention needed. And as the law makes clear, homeowners are required to provide. He should have dealt with that defective ladder left on the job site that day. He didn't. He should have dealt with the wet floors, or at least contacted Acme with his concerns. He did not. And most importantly, Your Honor, he should have dealt with that live 220 volt wire that caused Remington Stone's injuries. He did not. All this while being omnipresent on the job site. I ask you, Your Honor, is this adequate and reasonable precautions 
Under labor law section 200, it is not. And accordingly, we ask that you find in favor of Remington Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Sounds good. Great. Well, um, thank you all. First of all, just tremendous, tremendous job. And uh, I was hoping we could all give the competitors a round of applause for just an amazing. <laughs> Having myself done mock trials since high school, uh, since I was a freshman uh, in New Jersey, I, I know uh, how much work goes into this. And um, really, today we saw the uh, culmination of, of, uh, of, I was going to say, hundreds of hours, probably thousands of hours of work over the past several months for all of you. And um, it really paid off. And it shows. Um, um, what you can do when you really work hard and put your mind to it. Um, the uh, work ethic and skills that you've learned this year from this competition will serve you well your entire lives. If you become lawyers, which I certainly hope you will, because I would love to have people as prepared as you appearing before me in my courtroom or no matter what, what you do. I've, I actually um, just recently had a, um, a dinner uh, for my high school where I saw a bunch of the um, uh, uh, my teammates on my high school mock trial team, we were all getting together. Uh, and what I found interesting was um, a bunch of us went into law, a, a good number of us did, but not everyone. And the skills that we learned um, while doing mock trial in high school, we all agreed, helped us no matter what area we, we went into. So uh, I, uh, I hope you consider the law. We need good um, uh, ethical uh, civil attorneys uh, like all of you. Uh, in the legal profession, but whatever whatever you do, you'll be so tremendously successful. Um, uh, one of the challenges of giving comments at the end um, uh, for a, uh, a round like this is there's um, it's really hard to find stuff to be critical of um, because you all did such a great job. Um, the The jury addresses were outstanding. The openings I thought were were great. You both had such uh, good, clear themes. It was very clear early on um, what um, what you were going to focus on with your your evidence. Um, uh, um, you know, there were um, uh, two theories for for liability um, that you hit on, and we only have to prove one, but we're going to prove prove both and explained uh, why in a way that really previewed um, uh, previewed the case very well. Um, uh, I also thought, Ms. Mandel, something else you did very good was um, uh, be careful. You were careful not to rely on any evidence that you weren't completely sure was going to get in at trial. And you did that in a very persuasive manner. Um, and, and, and similarly, the theme of um, this case being about personal responsibility, I think, is the right, uh, the right argument um, here. Uh, um, um, delivery for both of you was great. Um, knowledge and introducing the judge to the law was very good. Um, um, I uh, um, certainly thought that that helped really make clear to me where both of you were going to be going with your presentations. Uh, the witnesses were tremendous. The directs were all so well organized. Um, um, uh, one thing you'll see um, is that different judges rule differently on the same issue. Um, you know, I, I probably allowed a little bit more in terms of leeway on cross, and some judges would, and you all did a great job of just rolling with that and adjusting as you, as you need to. Um, uh, you all did an uncross a very good job of controlling the witness as well. Um, these were very, very good uh, witnesses that you were cross-examining um, and pinning them down with, uh, uh, to get um, the answer that, that you needed, even if after the first two or three questions didn't give a responsive answer. Um, one thing that might be uh, good to do on direct sometimes is to, if you know that the, your witness is going to get cross-examined on particular areas, to try to pull the sting of that a bit on direct by, you know, at least having your own spin on it um, in front of the jury before before they hear it from uh, from cross. Um, but all of the witnesses were so well prepared for cross-examination. Um, the the experts were. We're real experts. Uh, 
Um, they were well prepared for Vardir coming after them, um, and they definitely convinced me that they knew what they were talking about uh, in, in their areas. Um, I'm bouncing around a bit, but I thought all of you hit the right areas of, of bias, um, uh, hit the right areas of cross-examination. Um, I thought um, it was, uh, uh, did a good job um, also on the cross-examination of, it must have been, been, been Stone, um, where um, um, initially I didn't allow the testimony about alcoholism to come in, to still get it in in, in the sense of lying um, uh, to uh, the prior, prior job supervisor. Um, so all the witnesses, again, were very convincing in character. I certainly uh, believe that uh, uh, Marley Miser was in a, an, an, uh, an old man who was not very happy that he was <laughs> dealing with uh, folks who weren't listening to him. Um, but to that end, I thought all of you, I thought it did a nice job of like, you know, um, dealing with a tough issue there because he had someone who was controlling um, for sure. But at the same time, the, this worker wasn't necessarily listening to him. So how can it be that they were supervising, uh, that, that Miser was supervising um, uh, uh, Ms. Doan? Um, closing arguments were really strong. I thought you did a very nice job of bringing together all the evidence um, uh, for both of you that, um, that came out during uh, the trial. Um, uh, it was clear that while you had, obviously, closings prepared, you, you adjusted as you needed to for what actually occurred and came out at trial. That's something that's very difficult uh, to do. And I thought you did a very effective job bringing it all back to the law, to the legal standards, um, uh, hitting on contributory negligence. Um, that's tough. Um, for the plaintiff side, so you focused on on what you needed to focus on, um, um, but all in all, this was really tremendous, tremendous work. Um, and uh, I, I love I love doing this way back when I first became a lawyer. I had, I've known uh, Mr. Young from uh, from being on the Wiles LYC committee. Um, was the State Bar Association, and I loved working on uh, the mock trial program back then, and it's such an honor to be able to come back the past couple of years and, and help, help judge it. Uh, the one terrible part of it, though, is at the very end when you have to pick one of the uh, two teams, which is just tremendously uh, difficult um, to do. And um, I cannot say that, um, say more how, how incredibly close uh, this, this was um, uh, um, and incredibly difficult um, it, it was. But I do have to um, uh, pick one of uh, the two and based on my tallying, and it again couldn't have been closer, but I, um, I did find the defense uh, prevailed in the case uh, narrowly. So congratulations to everyone. Um, uh, again, this is no, uh, the, the work that was done was just simply, simply tremendous. Um, and everyone should be very, very proud of, of, of what they did and, and their performance. And you have incredible futures uh, ahead of you. So congratulations.